So thank you all for coming. Good afternoon. Welcome to the New York City Bar Association. Um, it's a very old, reputable uh, place, as you can see. It sort of makes you feel small in this room, and it's quite impressive and monumental, but it's not about looks, really. It's about what happens inside of these halls and what people accomplish and how we try to adhere to the rule of law. And as we know, these days, in all sorts of ways, in all sorts of countries, rule of law is, is something sort of deceptive. We have to chase it instead of trying to really harness and, and make it a commendable way of uh, supporting people and the world. And today, we're, we're gathered here today on behalf of the United Nations Committee at the New York City Bar Association. I'll first say that I'm co-chair of the United Nations Committee, and Catherine right here is my, Van Kampen is my other co-chair, and Irvin Nina, can, uh, where he is, there he is, he's my other co-chair. So this has been, I hate to say something th this horrible maybe because it's about the Holocaust, but this has been a labor of love in terms of uh, it's difficult, uh, it's a difficult event to try to gather people together for because a lot of people, um, first it hurts, um, there's a lot of pain involved, and that type of tragedy, uh, as you know, is not something that you go see lightly and to bring and conjure up those feelings that you might have uh, if you watch reels or if you grew up in a family like I did. Um, my grandfather was in prison um, under Stalin for you know, 10 years and he went into the gulags and we escaped Soviet Russia. Persecution intolerance is, is a horrible thing, but this, this today is, is a commemorative uh, program on the history of the Holocaust and, unfortunately, the rise of global anti-Semitism. If you notice, it's, it's called the sound of the siren. Uh, I'm going to ask somebody in the room here as if it's a class. Does anybody know why? It's a title I came up with, but it's significant. So it's not the sirens of New York City that wake you up and don't let you sleep. That's not it. Uh, when you are in Israel, there's a moment of silence on the Yom HaShoah where, um, where you just stand and, and, you, and you're silent. And whether the, those sounds of the sirens or anything that, that happens to be around you, you hear but you commemorate um, the, the, all of the lives lost during the Holocaust. So uh, I have a panel here today. Uh, some very, very uh, established people in this field. And I would just want to say that we know that the Shoah or the Holocaust posed an enormous challenge to Judaism and raised numerous questions. And we go on believing after the Holocaust as Jews. But I do have a couple of questions to ask. Uh, where was God? It's a that kind of question where you don't normally ask a diplomat, a politician. It's sort of a esoteric question. But I'll start with, how do we go on believing? And you don't have to be Jewish or identify in the faith. But how do we go on keeping the faith uh, when something so horrendous happened? So I can start with, with Dan. <laughs> And uh, Dan, if you could just, I, I don't want to read off your accomplishments because I don't want to be Dostoevsky about it. So you can just say something about yourself that you feel most important. But believe me, everyone here is a, is a great expert, but not only so, is a soulful human being. So I ask you first, Dan. Uh, is this the beginning of the presentation, or am I just an intro? No, I just want to oh. just ask that oh. question. Uh, my name is Dan Carson. I'm co-chair of the Subcommittee on Anti-Semitism of the European, European Affairs Committee, chaired by Jonathan Halpern. And um, I am a lawyer by practice. I have uh, been a lawyer for 50 years, uh, and I started when I was 10. And um, <laughs> I um, uh, began my career as a prosecutor, and then for 35 years served with Kroll Associates, which is an international uh, risk consulting and business investigations firm. And, 
I joined as general counsel and retired as chairman in 2018. Um, I have uh, always been interested in the study of anti-Semitism. Um, I actually wrote my senior thesis in college on anti-Semitism and uh, restarted my interest in that after I retired from Kroll and began a study of the resurgence of anti-Semitism about three years ago. And I wrote the report, which is on your table now, called um, The Rise of um, Anti-Semitism Will uh, uh, de facto again become de jure. Thank you, Dan. So uh, I'll just ask that one, one question again. How do we keep faith in humanity? Forget the rule of law, but in, in that face of that particular atrocity, what would you say? Uh, I think what we do is um, uh, persist in the faith that uh, we were, um, as Jews, that we were uh, given, and we read about in, uh, in in the in the Torah. And uh, I suppose the watchword for me has always been "Ayeh uh, Asher Ayeh," God's uh, statement to uh, to Moses that I will be who I will be, and think in terms of the uh, the commandments that we have been given and, and have faith in the goodness in humanity and be ever vigilant uh, uh, of, uh, in, in, to, against those who oppose us. Thank you, Dan. Council General. Thank you. Briefly on that, it's obviously a very tough question, uh, but I believe challenges are there to be overcome and once we go through challenges, uh, we have to learn uh, from those challenges. And also, I believe that even in the darkest moments, uh, there is some signs, uh, some inspirational moments. And we have to learn from those inspirations, uh, so to be ready to, to prevent future tragedies uh, as the one you're referring to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, Schwartz. So first, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. My name is Rabbi David Schwartz. I am a, a somewhat retired uh, attorney. I uh, practiced for uh, 20 years at Wachtell Lipton, uh, had the opportunity to go to rabbinical school, uh, and now uh, am privileged to be here and to participate in this uh, program. Uh, the question that you ask is actually the main topic of what I hope to speak about. And so as a result, I'm going to use this as an opportunity, as a teaser for all of you to make sure that you stay through to the end so that you'll be able to hear my words. Excellent, thank you. We'll, we'll take your word for it that we, we have been teased just a tad bit to come back for more. Yifat. Thank you. Good morning, sorry, I moved because I was more comfortable uh, seeing the room from this side. Um, good morning. Um, so I work with the World Jewish Congress. I'm the director of international affairs. Um, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. And uh, at the World Jewish Congress, we work with Jewish communities around the world. And so I think there is where I see, you know, the continuity of Jewish life and belief in Jewish life and the Jewish communal life in Europe, but anywhere else in the world, in Australia, in South Africa, I met somebody, I speak from Mozambique, um, all the way to Chile, and really seeing the belief in the continuity of Jewish life, in the struggle to continue Jewish life, and also to strengthen Jewish communities and their work around the world, uh, and their work together for each other, and I think that's what <coughs> I see, God's belief in the Jewish people. Thank you for that. And now, um, Dan, if you don't mind your presentation, please. Thank you. Uh, let me begin also by, I, I'm a member of the um, Committee on European Affairs and chair of the Subcommittee on Anti-Semitism, and I want to recognize one of my colleagues who worked with me on the report, Elizabeth DeFeist, who was here today, a distinguished scholar, former dean of the Seton Hall Law School and a, a great international lawyer. Um, here is the main point I would like to get across today. Uh, we could now be back in the 1920s and 1930s. <clears throat> no, we are not in danger of another Holocaust, but we are in danger 
of the widespread pre-Holocaust civil and significantly political violence that took place then. There are strong indications today that the political conditions that led to the Holocaust beginning 100 years ago are occurring again in Europe, North America, and the Middle East. The current anti-Semitic violence and the proposal and enactment of certain laws and regulations may normalize anti-Semitism and threaten the lives and civil rights of Jews wherever they live in large number, but now especially in Europe. Uh, we know by every measure, poll, and study, anti-Semitism has escalated, especially so in the last 10 to 12 years. Uh, this slide could actually even be updated uh, and show uh, an even greater increase as, as reported by the organizations that are cited there. We also know uh, that there is, as the author uh, Daphne Calote pointed out just four days ago in the New York Times, uh, a shocking lack of knowledge across all age groups regarding the Holocaust. Uh, a, a, 2022 survey by the Anti-Defamation League found widespread belief in anti-Jewish tropes at rates unseen for decades. Three years ago, I began research on the resurgence of anti-Semitism in Europe. What I found, in addition to the attacks on people, synagogues, Jewish centers, businesses, and cemeteries, was the, re the, the reappearance of what I call, quote, unquote, official anti-Semitism. The introduction in European parliaments and councils of legislation that could be characterized as anti-Semitic. The laws and regulations fall essentially into three categories. First, legislation, what I call the historical memory laws. Uh, legislation that prohibits speech or writing that alleges that any country collaborated with the Nazis or was responsible in any part for the Holocaust despite the irrefutable evidence uh, and historical record that their governments either had formed alliances with the Nazis or collaborated with them. This was legislation that essentially expressed the view, our country was invaded, we were victims, we had nothing to do with the Holocaust. The other categories are laws, laws that restrict or prohibit the ritual slaughter of animals in accordance with Jewish kosher and Muslim halal law. And third, last, categories, legislation that seek to make circumcision also required by uh, Jewish and Muslim law illegal. Why am I making this alarmist, provocative statement that we are in danger of a, of a relapse to 100 years ago? I believe that if you took a poll among even educated people uh, about anti-Semitism, most people would uh, say that they're aware that over the years, over the centuries, uh, there have been episodes of persecution against the Jewish people. Uh, they would know that the Jews were blamed for the crucifixion of Christ, that Jews were blamed for the Black Death in the Middle Ages, and that they were victims of persecution in Russia and Eastern, European, Eastern Europe in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And of course, later were murdered, murdered in millions in the Holocaust. Uh, all of that is true, but very far from the complete truth. In fact, anti-Semitism and violence against Jews in history is far from episodic. Laws and regulations that discriminated against Jews were enacted and have existed in almost every European country in an uninterrupted continuum from, th from the, the early Middle Ages, the very formation of boarded countries through the end through the onset of World War II. I want to make sure I know I'm on touch with my slides. Um, another assumption is that the Holocaust began with the rise of the Nazis to power in 1933 and spread throughout Europe thereafter as they conquered and occupied nation after nation, beginning with the, the Anschluss, the occupation of Austria in 1938. In fact, the Holocaust was a slow-moving process that began with pogroms and anti-Semitic laws in the very countries listed in this slide. From the immediate end of World War II, well, I'm sorry, the immediate end of World War I 
and escalated across Europe gradually over a period of 20 years, starting well before the Nazis came to power and well before the Anschluss. It started with discriminatory laws and it ended with murder. And by the way, I've left out, unfortunately, left out Italy in this slide. Italy was not invaded by Germany until 1943, but began enacting anti-Semitic racial laws in 1938. From the 1920s to the 1930s, before the Nazis invaded th these countries, their, th their countries, anti-Semitic laws and regulations were being enacted all over Europe. The laws took many forms. Some laws affected Jews indirectly by denaturalizing their citizenship, nationalizing industries in which they were prominent, and others had a direct impact on Jews or denominated Jews directly through quotas on admissions to schools, memberships in professions, and banning them from government employment. But many of these laws did not specifically refer to Jews. Then when the war began and under occupation, the anti-Semitic laws increased with the, cooperation, with the cooperation of local governments and the local populations. Germany alone enacted 900 different laws that directly denominated Jews. And if you visit the, the Jewish Museum in Berlin, they have a, a remarkable exhibit in which these laws are listed on banners that take up almost the entire room. If we move from in time from the end of World War II to the beginning of the 21st century, anti-Semitism doesn't disappear, although it is diminished, obviously because the Jewish population in Europe has, has essentially been exterminated. But now, in the 21st century, anti-Semitism reemerges for many reasons, and the violence has escalated as well. Nationalism, nativism, and that form of communication we all hold in our hands, the cell phone, which carries with it the internet. What we are witnessing now are the warning signs of anti-Semitism, not just in the general population, but that has the seeds of government sanction. Today, politicians and political parties have succeeded in enacting or have introduced laws that directly proclaim their country's innocence during World War II. What is very disturbing about these laws, be they proposed or actually enacted, is that they resemble the enactment of the explicitly anti-Semitic laws in Europe that were enacted in the 1920s and 1930s. What drew my attention originally were the recent laws and regulations in Europe that were not specifically addressed to their Jewish populations, but clearly impacted them. The laws that are cited here uh, in, um, excuse me. The laws that are cited here in the countries that are listed are laws that in effect say we deny our any collaboration or any association with the Holocaust. In 2018, Poland passed a law that made it a crime to accuse the Polish government of collaboration with the Nazis, and it carried a prison sentence. After much pressure, the, that criminal aspect or the, the, the imprisonment aspect of the law was repealed, but you can still be charged, you can still be imposed with a civil fine for making that allegation. Uh, then you have a law cleverly enacted in Latvia in 2022, uh, which provides for reparations to the Jewish community some decades after the war, but also affirms that the Latvian government had nothing to do with, uh, with the Holocaust. In Lithuania, uh, there have been attempts to introduce such legislation the Holocaust, you can argue, actually almost began in Lithuania. Um, and that legislation in that country has, uh, was not successful. Um, the other category um, are the laws that um, prohibit kosher slaughter. Um, they are, they don't mention Jews, they don't mention kosher, 
but it has the effect. And in two of three provinces in, uh, in Belgium, kosher slaughter is now uh, prohibited, um, which was upheld by the European Court of Justice. Uh, there have been efforts to ban circumcision in uh, European countries, in Iceland and in Denmark. Uh, you don't have to mention Jews, but if you're enacting a law that prohibits circumcision, you know who that law is aimed at. It's aimed against the Jewish and the Muslim populations. Um, and it goes on as late as 2022. There's a law enacted in Latvia, 2022, a law in Russia. Um, the, uh, the alliance, um, the, uh, the, the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact is, is a matter of historical record, but if you allege that the, uh, the Russian government was allied with the Nazis, uh, that's a crime in Russia. Um, there has been major opposition to this. Uh, 20 countries prohibit Holocaust, the uh, Holocaust denial, speech that denies the Holocaust. There are laws that require education about the Holocaust. But as strenuous as this opposition has been, there was opposition back in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, Deborah Lipstadt, who is a distinguished professor at Emory University and is now the uh, special envoy uh, against anti-Semitism for the State Department, uh, when she speaks, she will tell you that if you are looking for the local synagogue in a European city and you can't quite find it but you're in the neighborhood, and you stop and ask someone, where can I find the synagogue? They'll tell you, just go look for the soldiers with the submachine guns. Um, that's where the synagogue is, because that is the level of protection that is required to protect members of the Jewish faith, um, not only in now, increasingly so, in the, uh, in the United States as well. Um, the, United, the Holocaust did not occur in a vacuum. It was not an isolated period in history. It was the culmination of centuries of anti-Semitism. We are, I think, and this may seem extreme to some, we are in the, the early 1930s version. A few countries pass laws that impact their Jewish citizens, and the world takes little or no notice. We have a law here and a law here that denies complicity with the Nazis, and a law that puts a sunset on reparations as do laws in Poland and Latvia, and a law that prohibits kosher and halal custom. And it starts to look like a familiar direction. I invite you to look at the appendices in the report uh, which my committee published and the Bar Association published. Um, and at the very back, there are appendices of the chronologies of the laws that were passed in the 1920s and 30s and the laws that are being passed now. And if you put them side by side, the very first law in Germany that can be characterized as an anti-Semitic law was an anti-kosher law in Saxony in 1933. That's how it starts. Um, and as a final note, I will just point out to you that uh, as late as 2020, if you went on the website of Oxfam, you could purchase a copy of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Uh, how it got there, um, uh, ignorance of history, it was taken down, but my point is it really has never gone away. It's not that, just that it's back. It has, like a latent spore, reemerged, and it is something that we must constantly be vigilant about and pay attention to. Thank you. so much, Dan. And I can't tell you, I, I'm, I also serve on the European Affairs Committee, uh, it's about second year now, and I can't tell you the amount of work that Dan has, has done, including the members of the committee. It's, it's, it's been phenomenal to just put everything together historically because there's a whole historical concept. And before we move on to, uh, to Consul General of Bulgaria, um, I, I will say that uh, it's, it's not really an anecdote, but I was in Berlin recently and uh, I had shared this with the MENA committee. I'll share it with you because I'm not afraid. Uh, it's a little bit on the tender side. But, so they were, they, the Hanukkah uh, lights were about to be uh, 
lit in the, in the center of the city, and I, this was my first time in Berlin, and I'm standing, and I hear some two, two, three people on the phone, and one of them gets on the phone and says in uh, either, I couldn't quite tell Polish or Ukrainian, and says, I, I can't believe these kikes have their menorah up. And I kind of stopped for a second. I looked at the, uh, these people, and I understood that they themselves are not native to Germany, and that they were perhaps emigres or maybe refugees. And that was sort of an assault to the conscience because I came in as an emigre, as a refugee, you know, having been the victim of bias, prejudice, you know, um, whoever hounds the Roma, hounds the, the Jews, hounds the African American community or the Asian community. And I couldn't believe they said that in the center, smack in the center of the city. And I, I just stood there for a while and thought about that. So it is definitely anti-Semitism on the rise if you can hear this vitriol, if you can hear those kind of, uh, that kind of hatred, even to this day. And now I'll go on with you. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'll take you. Please, take my... So I could see everybody. By all means. Hi, my name is Angel Angelov, or Angel Angelov. Um, I know it sounds peculiar. I'm the Consul General of Bulgaria. <clears throat> I arrived uh, here back uh, in August of the last year. But before that, I worked for 11 years at our permanent mission to the United Nations. So first, uh, ma'am, uh, first, thanks for the invitation to all of the co-chairs. I really appreciate the opportunity to be uh, here with you and to address you on this very important topic. Um, Ma'am, when you mentioned about the title, The Sound of the Siren, and the, the reason you put it there, yeah, I'm aware of that um, tradition, and I've been in Israel when the siren um, was uh, heard, but I also am fully aware of other incidents of uh, sounding the, the siren. Uh, for example, um, when you go to some of the kibbutz near the border with Gaza, uh, and when you hear the siren, uh, you have a certain number of seconds to, to hide. So the siren, uh, the sound of the siren is also a warning. Uh, and um, Dan already made a very, very clear point about uh, that we should uh, hear this warning uh, very well. So, being aware of that, uh, I'm here today to, to share a story uh, which hopefully could give us some uh, inspiration to fight this uh, despicable social phenomenon uh, called anti-Semitism. Uh, I'll start by going back to the horrors of the World War II. And, you know, unlike fairy tales, in the real world, particularly uh, in that very, very troubling time. Uh, there were not too many ideal examples of state behavior. Uh, there were no model states. Uh, it was a war, it was a carnage all over the world, <clears throat> but still, if we look closer, we could find those inspirational people and social movements uh, which showed us that the world could be a better place, even in those very, very dark times. It partially uh, refer reflects to your question, how we could take what happened and move on from that. So, I would like to share an experience from, uh, from my country, uh, Bulgaria, during the history's uh, darkest hours. Uh, this year, Bulgaria marks the 80th anniversary of the rescue of 50,000 Bulgarian Jews uh, during the Holocaust. And we also honor the memory of all of the victims of the Holocaust. Uh, we pay tribute to the courage and the moral integrity of those Bulgarians, among them politicians, clergymen, uh, intellectuals, and ordinary citizens uh, who made it possible. This act of bravery, intolerance, is a source of national pride. Not a single Bulgarian Jew was deported to the Nazi death camps or killed in Bulgaria. The entire Jewish community of Bulgaria, numbering around 50,000 people, survived the Holocaust. In fact, Bulgaria is the only country in Europe in which the Jewish community grew naturally during the war due to demography. The Bulgarian state facilitated the transit of Jews from Central Europe. Uh, who were fleeing the Nazi terror. 
As representative of the Bulgarian Foreign Service, I'm proud to note that uh, our embassies and consulates in Europe issued more than 15,000 visas for Jews escaping the horrors of the Holocaust. Uh, actually, many of uh, those Jews use Bulgarian ships uh, to move uh, towards historic uh, Palestine. Having said that, let me repeat again that we speak about the darkest period in the world history. And I doubt there are any states that do not have some painful memories and regrets uh, from that period of time. Pretty much anyone, I believe. So my country is not an exception from that. And some of the things uh, Dan already referred to. A year and a half after the beginning of the war, Bulgaria was forced to abandon its neutrality. At that time, our king was very aware of our history during the First World War and the Balkan Wars before that, so he knew that the Bulgarian uh, society is not ready for getting into another war. So for a relatively long time after the beginning of the war, uh, the government was trying to postpone uh, entering any of the fighting sites. At some point it was impossible. The, due to the results of the war, uh, the battles between the Italians and the Greeks, uh, the German army had to come in. So they pretty much uh, went through Romania, they were on Danube River, the border with Bulgaria, and the option for the government was whether the Germans are going to conquer us or they will just pass through us and continue. So obviously a very, very difficult uh, decision. I'm not here to justify, I'm just giving you the, the historical context of how that happened. Also, and even more importantly, we, we remember with pain the tragic fate of 11,343 Jews from former Yugoslavia and Greece, uh, who Bulgaria was not able to save from deportation, organized on Nazi initiative uh, and insistence. The territories were under a temporary Bulgarian administration, while Berlin considered them to be under the full and direct power of Germany, and the Jews living there to be under German jurisdiction. Bulgarian official and public figures have honored the, on numerous occasions the memory of those innocent victims. In a declaration of our National Assembly in 2013, uh, they condemned the criminal act of the Nazi regime and expressed regret that the local Bulgarian administration was unable to stop the deportation despite the attempts of Bulgarian citizens, public figures, and clergymen. Bulgaria, as Dan said, regretfully also adopted anti-Jewish legislation under the influence of Nazi Germany. But due to the deeply rooted tolerance of the Bulgarian society, anti-Semitism never met with general sympathy. And I'll quote you, uh, a cable from the Nazi ambassador to Bulgaria, Adolf Bekele. Uh, he complained to Berlin that Bulgarian people lack, quote, the ideological enlightenment, unquote, that the Germans have. He further explained that, quote, the Bulgarian who was raised with Armenians, Greeks, and Gypsies doesn't see in the Jews any flaws justifying taking special measures against them. I'll stop here with the historical overview and let the scholars uh, study the past and its immense complexity while accounting for the broader context of the events that took place during these troubling times. I would like to underline, however, that the saving of the 50,000 Bulgarian Jews during the Holocaust taught us a lesson about the essential role of civic mobilization in support of freedom, rule of law, and human rights. It's a powerful, positive example that inspires our efforts to fight the modern manifestations of anti-Semitism. If it was possible for our ancestors to save their Jewish compatriots in one of the darkest periods in world history, it should be possible for us to defeat modern anti-Semitism. Allow me in conclusion to share what Bulgaria is doing now to fight anti-Semitism. The historic tradition of tolerance I was referring to represents a solid foundation for the consistent effort to fight hate and intolerance, including all manifestations of anti-Semitism. 
The fight against anti-Semitism is one of the leading priorities of the Bulgarian government in the field of human rights. With the international organizations, Bulgaria persistently opposes all anti-Semitic initiatives and manifestations. And I mentioned I work in our permanent mission for 11 years at the UN, and I also, for like two years, I headed the Middle East North Africa Department at the Foreign Ministry. Uh, so I'm aware of this uh, policy uh, pretty well. Uh, as of 2018, Bulgaria is a full-fledged member of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA. Uh, its working definition of anti-Semitism is adopted in Bulgaria with a decision of the government. Uh, in 21, there was the Malmö uh, in Sweden International Forum on Holocaust Remembrance. And uh, countries made different pledges uh, how they're going, what kind of measures they're going to take to fight anti-Semitism. So, as a member, Bulgaria also made a couple of pledges. And practical steps we have done since uh, in implementing them is first, uh, we institutionalized the government with a ministerial decision, institutionalized the position of a national coordinator on combating anti-Semitism at the level of Deputy uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and officialized its coordinating functions. This ensures effectiveness of the national efforts to find anti-Semitism. Uh, also, uh, Bulgaria is, as a result of one of the pledges, is currently working on the first national action plan to combat anti-Semitism and preserve Jewish heritage. Uh, a couple of years ago, at the EU level, there was an uh, EU strategy to combat anti-Semitism adopted, uh, and many member states uh, started uh, developing their own planned strategies. So, uh, as the head of the Middle East North Africa Department, and because of my experience uh, at the UN on those issues, I was invited to join a, a group of experts, managerial group of like seven, eight people from different uh, ministries and institutions in Bulgaria. And we've been working on a draft. Uh, so hopefully we are going to have it ready very soon. Uh, it started with uh, a report similar to what Dan was referring to. Uh, we hired one of the agency that does uh, polls and research uh, to, to study the attitudes of the Bulgarian Jewish population and the Bulgarian population uh, in general uh, on different aspects of anti-Semitism. So that was the start of the process. Uh, and it, it's a challenge because we have to coordinate the work of many different institutions. We have to work with civil society, with the Jewish organizations in Bulgaria, with academia, uh, but it's, uh, it's worth the, the effort. Uh, so I'm finishing uh, by saying that in commemorating the 80th anniversary of the rescue and honoring all of the victims of the Holocaust, uh, the Consulate General, which I'm heading, uh, is organizing different events. Uh, 30th of March, we had a three-hour event at the Center for Jewish History. We uh, were partnered with the American Jewish Committee, Ivo Institute for Jewish Research, uh, American Jewish Musical Society, uh, the Bulgarian Consulate Evenings in New York, uh, etc. Uh, it was an amazing uh, event. There were many Holocaust survivors uh, joining us. Uh, and on 24th of April, uh, at the consulate, uh, I'm going to host a screening of a movie, A Question of Survival, the story of three Bulgarian Jews uh, at the, and the Holocaust. Uh, it's an amazing story about uh, their, those three guys. Unfortunately, all of them uh, recently passed away. Uh, so they, they tell their story about how they felt as little kids in Bulgaria when this process started. It was very dramatic, let me say, that at some point there was an order given that uh, a certain number of Bulgarian Jews, uh, again, I told you there were about 50,000, so a certain amount of them were rounded up, uh, brought to the train station to be transported somewhere. People had no idea. Uh, but fortunately, the order was rescinded. Uh, it, was, it happened on March 10th. That's why March 10th is the day we, uh, we celebrate, we commemorate. So uh, in the movie, those guys are telling how they saw the events as little children. And 
Afterwards, they uh, moved out of Bulgaria after the end of the war, and eventually all of them ended up in the States. Uh, so they share their story. It's, it's very, very dramatic, very interesting. So all of you are invited. Okay, I cannot <laughs> accompany, uh, accommodate all of you, but uh, whoever is interested, uh, we have a relatively small uh, space, uh, but you're most welcome, and there will be more events. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be here, guys. Thank you so much, Council General, and for for relaying this information to us, and also for it, it, it's it's moving to know that uh, we have some sort of recollection and that we remember and commemorate, but also that we now play safeguards um, for this to again never happen, because I always say that the worst atrocity is the deep complicity that people have. Um, so thank you for that. Yes. First again, thank you, Sophia. Uh, it occurred to me that there's actually another meaning uh, to your title, uh, The Sound of the Siren, that we think about the siren song, something that is attractive and yet very destructive, and that I think also speaks to anti-Semitism. And so I think that uh, your, your title was quite appropriate. I ask that you all please rise as I say the, as I lead us through the memorial prayer for the six million Jewish and other victims of the Holocaust, along with the millions of others. El male rachamim shochein bameromim hamensei menucha nechona takar kanfei ha Vimalot kidoshim to rim kizo harakia mazirim, Lichol nishmo cheshes millione ayudim, Ved kohalea shoa be rupa, Shener go, shenish ratu, shenis refu, vinishes fu, Al kidush hashem, Bide hamratzim ha germanim, Beozre hem mishar hamim, Bavur shakal mispalim badas karas nishmo sehem, then God aid in the Hemenu Hassam, Lachain Balarachamim, Yasti Rain Besser can a Fablo Lamim, Be its roar, Bitsura Hayim is Nishmo Sehem, Adonayu Nakla Sam, Be a Nukovishalom al Mishkavo Sam, Be am Dula Goralam the Kate Hayamim, Vinomar Amen. Merciful God in heaven, grant perfect repose under your divine wings among the holy and pure who shine bright as the sky to the souls of those six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust and who have passed on, on their eternal, to their eternal habitation as our community prays for their souls and the souls of all who perished in the Holocaust. May their place of rest be in paradise. Merciful one, keep their souls forever alive under your protective wings and bind their souls in the bonds of life. The Lord being their heritage, may they rest in peace, and let us say, Amen. Please be seated. When Sophia reached out to ask that I share a few words today, she asked that I address some of the most difficult questions regarding the Holocaust. Where was God? How can one be a believing Jew after the Holocaust? Is faith in humanity still possible? Given the scope of evil in the world, does God still care about my religious observance? I have my own answers to these questions, but these are ancient questions. The psalmist wonders in Psalm 94, which many Jews read every Wednesday today, how long shall the, uh, shall the wicked triumph? They crush your people, Lord. They kill the widow and the stranger. They murder the orphaned. They say the Lord does not see. God pays no heed. And the questions are no easier today. Lucy D., along with her two daughters, Maya and Rena, murdered while driving along a highway on a way to a picnic and a hike. Taurus Alessandro Perini, killed in a car ramming attack that also injured six others. 
the shooting deaths of two brothers, Hill and Yagel Yaniv, yeshiva students who were heading home from their school, the car ramming death of a six-year-old Yaakov Yisrael Paley and his eight-year-old brother, Asher Menachem, all of whom were murdered since the beginning of February. As Dan Carson mentioned, all this highlights how anti-Semitism and persecution of Jews is ancient and yet remains troubling today. So where was God? The answer to this question and the difficult question of evil in the world requires introspection from each of us. Elements may include how we understand free will, our faith that God's judgment spans both this world, the world we live in, and what happens after we die. The need to make space for humanity to respond to evil, and like the story of the saving of 50,000 Jews in Bulgaria shared by uh, Ambassador Angelov. And the effect that we can have when we are there for one another after tragedy. Whatever answer we offer, we must be careful that we never blame the victim. Remarkably, Judaism does not offer a single answer to these questions. In a lecture to his Park Avenue synagogue congregants that I happened to cross this past weekend, Rabbi Milton Steinberg noted that Judaism does not have a required creed or dogma. Although Maimonides wrote his 13 principles of faith, many have disagreed with them, with some, including Rabbi Steinberg, offering alternatives. These principles include things like faith in God and God's omniscience, belief in reward and punishment, and trust in the prophets and in the Bible. However, none, none of the principles that have even been proposed come close to addressing these questions. So where does that leave us? I encourage you to develop your own answer to these questions. If these questions really trouble you, Talk to a rabbi or a spiritual leader, but don't, whatever you do, don't let them paralyze you. Judaism says to act in the ethics of our fathers, the second chapter, the 21st Mishnah. It says, Lo alecha hamalacha ligmor, velo ata ben chorin livatel mimena. Loosely translated, you don't have to complete the job, but you're not exempt from trying. You're not exempt from trying. And indeed, I don't know whether it was intentional or not, but today is the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, April 19th, 1943. You can make a difference. I want to close with something shared by Rabbi Herschel Schachter in a letter to his parents explaining his decision to enlist in the army in World War II. Rabbi Schachter would eventually become known as the Rabbi of Buchenwald as he entered and served the concentration camp victims there upon the camp's liberation on April 11, 1945, just over 78 years ago. Before enlisting, Rabbi Schachter already had a pulpit serving congregation Aguda Shalom in Stamford, Connecticut, so not that far away, beginning his service in May 1941, i.e. just before Pearl Harbor, and shortly after his ordination. As the youngest child to his parents, they were very opposed to his enlisting, figuring that he could best serve the Jewish community by remaining in his current position. Rabbi Schachter responded in his letter, by offering a new take on the Garden of Eden story. After Eve gives Adam some of the forbidden fruit and the couple realizes that they are naked, they hear God passing through the garden, so they hide. When asked, Adam explains to God, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. Rabbi Schachter suggests that Adam was really saying, 
and I share Rabbi Schachter's words. I heard the rousing trumpet sound of battle that is rising and stirring the conscience of my soul. But I'm afraid to enlist in the armed forces to fight, to protect my life, the lives of my relatives, and the existence of my people. I am stripped of courage and strength, and I hide. Rabbi Schachter refused to hide. He enlisted and participated in the U.S. Army's liberation of Buchenwald. Whatever we do, however we answer the difficult question of how we face evil in this world, may we always display courage and strength. May we never hide. As I began with a prayer, let me end with a prayer. This is the prayer that we say every week in my synagogue on behalf of the United States of America. It is a prayer inspired by the tremendous good that this country is capable of performing, consistent with displaying the necessary courage and strength of character to never hide from doing what is right. As I asked at the beginning, I ask now again, please rise. Ribon Kol Haolamim, ruler of the universe, please protect America's democracy and bless us, the people of the United States, who have established the constitution and laws of this country. El Rahum, compassionate God, plant love, peace, and friendship among us, and uproot all hate and envy from our hearts. Give us the wisdom to select leaders who revere truth and despise corruption. Enable us and our chosen representatives to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with you, our God. Inspire us to lift a lamp of welcome and kindness and to proclaim liberty throughout the land for all its inhabitants. Strengthen the hands of those who guard America's freedoms and protect them from harm. May Judah be saved and Israel dwell securely. And let us say, Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Schwartz. So before I go on to you fought, and thank you for your prayers. Uh, I'm, I came to this country, as I said, as a refugee, and America is indeed a great country, um, as it gives refuge in whoever stands beside uh, uh, the Statue of Liberty, as you walk around, you, you see and you read the, the words, the remarkable poems that are so inspiring. Uh, but uh, I had a, a, a professor at a university whom I invited to this event, and I won't say which university, and he said he couldn't come. And I said, why, you're busy? And he said, no, I'm not busy. I don't want to come because this is something that it doesn't really concern America. He said that, uh, and he, he's Jewish. Uh, he said, I understand you come from Eastern Europe, and I understand you come from a family of refugees, and I understand that you were fleeing persecution, but that only occurs there. It doesn't happen here, so why should I be worried? And I don't want to take my time to, to hear this, because it doesn't, it's not going to affect me or my family his professors in his 70s, so maybe he should know better. Because that's exactly what the Jews thought when they were in Germany, and they didn't want to face a reality that was softly approaching, but then that ended in Kristallnacht. And so I said, you're making a mistake, because it can happen here. And in fact, there has been a rise in anti-Semitism with the desecration of temples, beaten up of rabbis, um, you know, the hate, the vitriol, the, the, all, the, all those things that, that, that are written in the reports that you have. So I'm very glad that we commemorate this today to make sure that um, it doesn't happen. Yifat. You can come up if you like. I'm, if okay. You from thank you. And thank you for inviting me um, to speak here. As you mentioned, it's Yom HaShoah, or in Hebrew, actually, Yom HaShoah Vatkuma. Right? We, we each can add to 
what this day is. So it's the day of uh, the Holocaust uh, remembrance and, and revival or resurrection. So um, I, I was going to start with, with some numbers, but then I realized I'm amongst uh, lawyers. So <laughs> I, uh, I'm a lawyer myself, so no, no, no offense there. But I decided to actually, as I was walking into this building, literally walking in, uh, one of my colleagues in Geneva sent me um, a petition that is now running in Geneva. It's a petition against a memorial that my organization, the World Jewish Congress, and uh, the Jewish community of Geneva and of Switzerland, CICAD, is working with the local authorities um, to establish a monument for the Holocaust in Geneva. And this petition that is circulating, that was sent to me this morning, uh, is against uh, this memorial. And I'll just give, to, to kind of frame this, um, a couple of quick notes that I pulled out. Well, I was just sitting outside. Quick quotes that I pulled out from this petition on the topic. Uh, and it's, it's long, so I, I did, and it's in French, so I just translated a few of them. Um, let me hear one says, the report of the Red Cross organization, which had free access to all of Hitler's camps, completely refutes the existence of the Holocaust. Another quote is, in 1988, during a trial in Canada, the ICRC admitted that it had never found the slightest proof of the existence of homicidal gas chambers in German camps, and that the expression extermination camp was a term coined by the Allies. One more, this for... The Jewish Holocaust hawks spawned many sub hawks, like the one that inspired this image, which you can't see, but it's a person holding a gun, a Jewish person holding a gun to the world and asking for money, um, purported to depict German soldiers throwing live Jewish babies into a burning pit, very similar to accounts popularized by the Jewish fraudster Elie Wiesel. And I think my organization, specifically in this petition, is called, I think, uh, the worst, I didn't, maybe I didn't quote this, but uh, the, the most extreme, uh, oh, here we go. The most feared supremacist organization, the World Jewish Congress. So that, that's my new title from today. Um, but these, this is one example that literally came to me this morning. And I'm going to use these few minutes to speak about the issue of Holocaust denial and distortion, um, and es especially online, which is one of the major focuses of my work in my organization and where we find it. I'll do the numbers in a little bit. Um, but I'll give a short overview, and I think this connects to the topic here. But Holocaust denial and distortion, is, it's not a new phenomenon, right? It exists since the persecution of Jews by the Nazis and their collaborators exists. Um, but it's receiving a lot of renewed attention these days, and it is definitely spreading much faster and much wider as well. In large part, this has to do with the online world and the ease in which the information is spread and how easily information is created today, how truthful you can make uh, information seem and evidence, and also our opinions and our societies becoming more extreme and more divisive. And these are really the times where anti-Semitism grows and also the rise of Holocaust denial and distortion. And while we know that interest and care about the Holocaust is, is still high in many parts of the world, as we see today, but there are many studies indicating that there are just huge gaps in knowledge about the Holocaust. Um, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions that circulate widely, and just the level of historical understanding, even in countries where Holocaust education is uh, developed and is mandatory, is very poor. And then we have people who also just do this um, to promote their own ideological, political, and immoral uh, agendas. And we heard this already in the beginning with some of the laws and ideas circulating today. So the, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, with which the Consul General of Bulgaria mentioned already, defines Holocaust denial as attempts to claim that the Holocaust, the Shoah, did not take place. And it can include publicly denying or calling into doubt the use of principal mechanisms of destruction, such as gas chambers, mass shootings, starvation, torture, or the intentionality of the genocide of the Jewish people. Uh, a year ago, since this is also the, a, a UN committee meeting, a uh, UN uh, affairs committee meeting, a, a year ago in January 20 of 22, the UN General Assembly actually adopted by consensus, but it's a different story for the UN, 
uh, a resolution on Holocaust denial. And the resolution notes also, among others, that Holocaust denial refers to discourse and propaganda that deny the historical reality and the extent of the extermination of the Jews by the Nazis and their accomplices during the Second World War, known as the Holocaust or Shoah. And I want to quote one, it's, it's a longer resolution, I'll, I'll quote one more thing that's very important in this resolution, in, in our opinion, which is bearing in mind that Holocaust denial in its various forms is an expression of anti-Semitism. I think that's one issue that, um, th that is questioned for many years, and I think it's very important, and I'll, I'll speak a bit about it, why Holocaust denial and distortion is an expression of anti-Semitism and promotes anti-Semitism today as well. And also distortion, the issue of distortion doesn't deny that the Nazis and their collaborators sought to murder the Jews of Europe, but it really significantly and purposely, purposefully misrepresents the historical records. Um, the, the Holocaust is, you know, um, is, is sometimes I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention a few, a few ways where, Holo, where we see Holocaust distortion today in a, in a moment um, and distortion, but we really speak today a lot more about the distortion because it's a way where people can kind of claim, well, we're not denying that the Holocaust actually happened, but in many ways, um, by distorting the facts, you're diminishing the Holocaust, the story of the Holocaust, the intentionality of the Holocaust, um, trivializing these events and causing a lot of harm, a lot more harm sometimes than denial itself today, which is easier to refute with facts and with knowledge. Um, so, so why does this matter? Um, you know, hardcore Holocaust deniers are driven a lot of times by kind of far-right extremism ideology. They're deeply anti-Semitic in their worldview. Uh, this is part of their ideology. Um, but it exists also in other circles, right? Um, it exists also in other extremist movements, it exists in radical Islam, and it exists also on, uh, on far-left um, far groups as part of this kind of anti-global, anti-capitalist discourse that also has very anti-Semitic undercurrents linking Jews with global capitalism, linking Jews with you know, a lot of other Jewish conspiracies, global control, um, and, and uh, yeah, global control and, and global capitalism. A, a degree of anti-Semitism must be at play when you accept any questioning of the Holocaust. Uh, I'll be the second one to quote Deborah Lipstadt today. Uh, the, the U.S. Special Envoy in the Combating Anti-Semitism, um, and a scholar on Holocaust denial. Um, but when she, she points out, she says, the first question anyone would ask themselves when faced with such information is, why would Jews make this up? And if you don't ask that, it's because you're, you're being seduced by these arguments. You have to believe at some level basic anti-Semitic tropes that Jews are powerful and manipulative and capable of creating a worldwide fake Holocaust. And so these representations of the past, the distortion of the Holocaust, you know, they distort our public knowledge, our memory, our discourse, our understanding. They threaten our understanding of one of the most you know, tragic and violent histories of the world. And the more they spread, it's harder to fight this. And at the end of the day, it's going to be harder for us to fight other mass atrocities and other genocides. It's not just a historic academic dis discussion that some have claimed. It is hate speech, and it's hate speech aimed at delegitimizing and erasing the Jewish people and their history. In a few words, I'll say how we find today um, Holocaust denial distortion, especially online. The WJC, along with UNESCO and the UN um, Department of Communications, published a report in July 22 um, on Holocaust denial and distortion online, mainly focused on distortion. Uh, here's when, when I'm going to bring the numbers, sorry. 16.4% um, of the information on Holocaust in, uh, online that was found in this research, and it was done by the Oxford Internet Institute, um, was Holocaust denial distortion. On Twitter, this is before Elon Musk, so a long time ago. On Twitter, <laughs> one in five pieces of information about the Holocaust were Holocaust denial and distortion. On TikTok, 17%, um, I'm even too old for TikTok, uh, but 17% <laughs> of the information were Holocaust denial and distortion. And these are platforms that have um, moderation and regulation of information about the Holocaust. Um, 
and here's where it gets really shocking, on Telegram, which is not moderated and has no content moderation or regulation, nearly half, 49% of Holocaust denial, uh, Holocaust information was denial or distortion. When you went to German language information, 80% of German language public information on Telegram was denying or distorting the Holocaust. Um, and, and we see it manifest in many ways. There are celebrations of the Holocaust. Uh, you know, six million wasn't enough. It's circulated here in the, widely used here in the US as well. There are attempts to blame, uh, the, blame the Jews for the Holocaust, actually accusing them of causing, you know, causing our own genocide, arguing that we were complicit in the Holocaust, uh, or that um, it was deserved or provoked. Um, some of it is delegitimization, um, depicting Israel as a Nazi state, equating Israeli policy towards the Palestinians um, with the gas chambers, the death camps, um, mass murders used in the Holocaust. Um, there's a lot of what we call smearing, um, claiming that the Jews are exploiting or are seeking to benefit from the Holocaust, uh, claiming that the Holocaust is given more importance than it deserves, or my favorite, that Jews talk too much about the Holocaust and use it to manipulate others. Um, th there's also the issue of equating uh, the Holocaust with other uh, worldwide events, and I'm not saying that equating at any point the Holocaust to mass atrocities is wrong or in any way a Holocaust denial distortion, but there are definitely ways in lines where equating the Holocaust to other atrocities diminishes the, uh, again, the intentionality or the um, the intent, and then we've all been through some years of COVID, so a lot of our work during these years, last few years, has been about um, kind of explaining and trying to convince, uh, especially internet and social media companies, why equating COVID uh, measures uh, to Holocaust uh, measures and Nazi measures against Jews and others um, is wrong and is hate speech as well, and denying and distorting the Holocaust. So um, those are parts of equating the Holocaust that diminish its uh, memory. So I'm just going to say, um, maybe on a, you know, you're welcome to read this report and, and look at our work on, on issues of Holocaust denial and distortion today. Um, but I, I want to note maybe a few things that can be done, um, and, and two issues of, of, well, two areas which are especially problematic. But um, well, one thing that can be done, especially um, like forums like this, um, obviously education. I think that's one thing where the more I dive deep to this, into this, I see that by the time our children and grown-ups face this information, if they didn't have any other information, digital literacy, uh, media awareness, knowing how to look at resources and understand what the resources are that you're looking at, by the time they reach it online, in France it was noted that 40% uh, of students uh, found information about the Holocaust online first, um, and most of that was Holocaust denial and distortion information. Um, it's too late, and so we really need to work. Um, you know, my my kids are young, but we need to work from um, an early age, but also work across the population, education, digital literacy, uh, and spread accurate and credible information as much as possible. Um, the World Jewish Congress, along with UNESCO, also uh, worked with uh, social media companies on integrating credible information into the uh, social media. So if you Again, not TikTok, but we can do it on Facebook maybe. Um, if you open Facebook or TikTok or Instagram today and you actually search for something like uh, Hitler or Treblinka and words associated with the Holocaust or Holocaust deniers, again, D David Irvine, who, uh, who was um, um, the, the Holocaust denier in, in Deborah Lipstadt, um trial on the issue, you will f actually be prompted to, uh, you know, there will be a definition of what the Holocaust was, and you will be prompted to about holocaust.org, which is a website of WGC and UNESCO uh, with facts about the Holocaust. So um, also on TikTok and um, doing a lot of policy, hopefully on, on some others that we're working on uh, soon enough. So education, doing positive education, putting credible information out there is key. And again, since we are with lawyers, I will finish with uh, maybe a note on, on legislation. Uh, there are over 20 uh, states that have uh, laws against Holocaust denial and distortion or Holocaust denial. Um, I think any, look, any legislation that can either 
work on well, in New York now there's legislation on Holocaust education uh, that needs to be implemented, um, but also on issues such as Holocaust denial and genocide denial uh, really makes a difference also in the online sphere. I'll finish there. Thank you very much, Ifat. Uh, it's, it's no doubt that the, the internet gives rise to a certain a different kind of uh, uh, ability to uh, hate and to use that on the World Wide Web, and that's for sure. Um, but uh, had been back to a while ago, I had a professor at New York University, uh, Yevgeny Yevtushenko, and he was the one that wrote Babi Yar, it was a poem, and there was some student that said that never happened. And uh, people know Babi Yar, they can't say that it does, didn't happen. Also, Ben Ferenz, Benjamin Ferenz, the, the great lawyer and prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials, just died at the age of 103. Um, it's not possible to not think of his words and the atrocities that he was uh, capable at the age of 27 of actually going ahead and trying as such a young lawyer, but uh, that's undeniable. And I would agree with Yafat that, uh, that in order to deny the Holocaust, um, which is, I think, the best documented genocide in history, it is in itself anti-Semitism. So I thank my panel. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any questions that we can ask? Yes, John. Hi, thank you. Uh, I have two questions, actually. The first is something that troubles me. We know about the hatred of anti-Semitism. We know about the hatred of other ethnic and populations who are... Uh, Okay. Well, you want the second one now, or should I hold my peace? And it, it's, it, I won't be answering. Uh, panelists, would you like the second one right now hold at you, or would you take? Yes, we would like it right now. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, we'll go, the yes, they want it now. Yeah. They want. Yeah. Okay. The second question is: uh, When Schindler's List came out, I was in heaven. I thought we finally have something that no one can argue with. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Yes, Dan. Thank you for that question. I'm, with respect to your first question, is it sounds like is all hate the same? Is is that the nub of your question? Are all? Yeah, I, I would say no because um, a lot of it is dictated by different reasons. Uh, the, the Rohingya in in Burma are being persecuted because they're a vocal minority, not necessarily because of their religious beliefs. The hatred that exists between in, in individual Muslim sects is based in religion. The hatred against Jews um, is, is, can be based partly in religion and partly in the fact that they've never had, historically never had a nation, never had a, a land of their own. Um, so I think it's a very diverse answer. Your second question about um, uh, Schindler's List, I, I would point you to a very interesting article published this week in Atlantic Magazine by Dara Horn, who is a, a novelist, and, but who writes about the Holocaust and writes about anti-Semitism. And she made in part your point, which is that the study of the Holocaust, the emphasis on the Holocaust is beginning to trivialize anti-Semitism itself. And she states that this at attention to the Holocaust, while benign in many respects, is also excusing or, or ignoring the, the microaggressions that exist in day-to-day -day anti Semitism. So I would point you to that article, as I said, in, in this month's Atlantic by Dara Horn. So two, two really very good questions, and the second one I think is you have put your finger on something which um, is, is very real. 
I'll just add that uh, I think that the uh, question about uh, hatred uh, of Jews and potentially others, uh, there are, is an important difference, but at the same time, the effects are, uh, can be quite similar. And so when, we, when the question is, is sort of like how one deals with it, um, and in particular, how one deals with the ramifications of hate and and bias and and the like, often they uh, it it may be appropriate to to treat. But when you're trying to address the root causes or understand the hatred itself, I think that actually lumping together or considering them together uh, actually um, elides over an important difference, and that is the fact that. Uh, the hatred of Jews seems to come from every single uh, an angle. That it doesn't make a difference if you're uh, a communist, so then you can hate Jews because they're capitalist. If you're a capitalist, you could hate Jews because they're communists. It, it, the fact that you that you have that that I think is relatively unique and and makes it much much different. And as a result, when it comes to trying to address the underlying and the goals of trying to eliminate the hatred itself, that suggests that uh, that we need unique and different techniques to, to address that. I wonder whether Yifat has something to say on that particular point. Um, sure, I'll, I'll try and, and quick comments, and especially what we see in the online sphere. When we started working um, with companies on hate speech online and anti-Semitism, um, our, our first maybe aha moment was looking at, at the time, Facebook uh, hate speech policy, and it spoke about uh, derogatory terms, so using derogatory terms um, towards towards others and, and groups based on protective status, um, and and this kind of aha moment was well, you know, anti-Semitism doesn't fall under this because a lot of times it's the conspiracies against Jews are not about um, them being, uh, you know, derogatory. It's not when you look at the genocide against the Tutsis. Speaking of cockroaches, or today. Um, director in that sense. It's about control, it's about media, it's about power, uh, it's about cons you know, conspiring together. And so it won't fall under the regular definition of a hate speech. So I think while the hate is, is similar, the manifestations are sometimes different and we need to kind of look at those manifestations and how we combat them uh, effectively today. Tomorrow I'm heading to a hate studies conference in Washington and uh, see what people there say about these issues. Um, so I think that's one issue that we, we especially see when trying to deal with this effectively through hate speech uh, legislation and policies. Um, but I will say that they go together, especially we see online, like when we do even the Holocaust denial and distortion research or online anti-Semitism, um, it's rarely just Jews in any post, right? It'll be against uh, Jews, against black people, against Roma people, against LGBTIQ, like it's really only Jews in post and definitely in users as well. Um, you know, the users will go, if not in that specific post, against others. So the hate definitely goes together um, in the groups and the same people hate, you know, a lot of different uh, groups for, for different reasons. And then shortly on, on your second comment, because this is something that today is going to be, I think, much more important because AI and we you know, we had to say AI at some point, right, um, today. Um, but AI is going to just be much more of a challenge with creating credible information, uh, and it's much easier to create um, what seems credible and, and correct historical narratives. There's already photos uh, of, uh, you know, circulating of Auschwitz with no gas chambers, uh, Auschwitz breaking out with no gas chambers. Um, you know, there's images of survivors. There, there's like deep fake, so an image of a survivor but they've changed the, what they were saying to be denying the Holocaust. So it's going to be easier to create that. It's going to be a challenge on the, on the creative part with what um, AI is going to do to our ability to ensure that the information out there and the creative information out there is also uh, true. Thank you. Yes. Uh, follow up from this last discussion, I might consider the uh, comparison of with, for example, the massacre in Cambodia of people anti-Semitism, and how do you define that term with respect to the How might you define that term in comparing the misfortune of one group with another? Thank you. 
I would need to put some more thought into uh, uh, defining that as anti-Semitism, but um, the, the importance of speaking, you know, a lot of times it's important of speaking of Holocaust as, you know, uh, one, like a very unique event, but also part of genocides and mass atrocities um, is both because it has its unique aspects of the Holocaust in, in terms of, you know, um, everything that, that we know here around the table, uh, size and, and duration and uh, et cetera. But with, with genocide especially, we look at intent, right? And, and what's really important is here, what was the intent of the people, what was the intent of the Nazis and genocide, what was the intent in Cambodia when we define, get this room of lawyers, so when we define genocide in that sense, right, we're looking at the intent to destroy a people based on their protective characteristics. Um, and in those senses, you know, I look at all genocides with those, that similarity. And also when, even when working on Holocaust denial and distortion, while looking at that, we do work a lot. And, you know, yesterday I was with the UN uh, Office of the Prevention of Genocide, actually. What lessons can we learn from working on Holocaust denial and distortion and combating that for combating other genocide denials and distortions? Um, the deniers definitely learn from each other. Uh, and take the lessons learned and, uh, and, and methods and means learned. Uh, so how can we learn from working on that? So I avoided the part about is it anti-Semitism, but hopefully responded a bit. I, I think if you look at the mass extermination of six million people over a period of 12 years across an entire continent who were singled out for their, solely for their religion, you distinguish it from uh, the political, like, political yet horrific murder of people in one country, regardless of their, their affiliation, I think you would put that in a class along with the intentional starvation or starvation of any million number of million of Chinese during the so-called Great Leap Forward or the very intentional starvation of the Ukrainian people uh, during uh, under Stalin. So it, it does exist in a class by itself. Thank you. Yes. Just, oh, yes. yeah, just uh -huh. to briefly uh, build on what uh, the previous speaker said. Uh, indeed, uh, for me, Holocaust is uh, it's a genocide, but it has very unique features. Uh, and Dan was giving examples for different uh, hatreds. Uh, and you could see that in different places. It's, however, more localized. Uh, Hutu Tutsi is in a particular part of the world. Uh, with, the, with the Holocaust based on anti-Semitism, uh, it's, it's a larger scale. Uh, it goes uh, in a global level, uh, which makes it, uh, as said, uh, in a class uh, of its own. And that's why it's so important, however, uh, what the previous speaker mentioned, that Learning from that experience, we have to be able to draw lessons and to prevent further forms of genocides. Uh, so we always have to be on the lookout uh, for these small, uh, small steps. Uh, I come from the Balkans, uh, and Yugoslavia, a neighbor of my country, uh, which was uh, pretty much the most successful socialist country at that time of the Cold War uh, and was believed to be the first one to join the European communities uh, one day, uh, fall apart and uh, we had genocides there. So it was pretty much not ex expected, but it happened uh, because the initial signals were not uh, registered uh, on time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Yes, and then I'll go around, the, yes.
Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Um, who else wanted to ask? And then you. Okay. Go, go ahead, and then I'll get to you, Lee. Yes, Mr. Lefkov. Distortion. Thank you. Anyone else? Lee. I want to ask the uh, panel this question. I don't like Shinzo. I don't like that. No? Or just a hook? And I'm asking this as I see this kind of film as a. So if you read a book like. Anyone? Thank you. Anyone on the panel want to address? Yeah, I could briefly yeah. try. Thank you. Uh, obviously, very good question. I see your point, but I believe that with the time, the memories of what happened are disappearing. Uh, and at the same time, movies are a really way to, to influence, uh, to inform, to, to educate. So I definitely see the point of finding this excuse. 
uh, but at the same time, movies help us to keep this on the radar. Uh, this helps many young people learn about uh, the Holocaust. Uh, in a, and that particular movie, because it was very successful, uh, it, uh, many people heard about it. So this is a way, in a way, to have, in, uh, in foreign affairs, we call it public diplomacy, uh, ways to, to educate people. But at the same time, obviously, we have to, uh, to keep the record straight uh, and to go beyond just uh, movies. I'd like to just make a comment. First, I want to thank the gentleman here for the comment that he made um, and support it by saying that one of the, <clears throat> the ways in which the Nazis made the Holocaust acceptable was to persuade their people that Judaism was not a religion, it was a race, um, and that to a large extent facilitated and, and, and energized the, the concept of Volk that the, the, the Germans were superior. Um, secondly, with respect to your comment, I'm going to read you a quote from the, the article. This is the magazine I was referring to, uh, where Dara Horn writes, one problem with using the Holocaust, perhaps Schindler's List, as a morality play is exactly its appeal. It flatters everyone. We can all congratulate ourselves for not committing mass murder. So you make a good point, which, as I said, I commend this article. Um, uh, in striking a balance between teaching, which is important because showing the movie To Kill a Mockingbird accomplishes the same thing. It's a very instructive and good movie. Um, but at the same time, we have to be careful about sanitizing the, the horror that was committed. I just want to add that uh, I, th I think that uh, this event and uh, context is crucial in connection with these kinds of, uh, of questions. That if we're going to, you know, I, on some level, uh, I, my hope is is that we all leave this room feeling like we actually, one, made a difference in our own lives and that we have an opportunity to make a difference in other people's lives. And if that's the view that a person comes to watching Schindler's List with, then it's going to be a positive. But, it, but you're absolutely right that, uh, that there is a risk associated with it. And I think we deal with that risk by creating venues in which, like this program, we have an opportunity to discuss the issue and have questions and responses, but also put it into a context in which we, you know, I, I'm hopeful that we'll have opportunities to hear from others as well, um, um, uh, victims of the Holocaust and people who who uh, have the, uh, suffered through uh, some of those uh, times because that will give us an opportunity to have the relationship that, that, that is actually a positive relationship with the, with the movie of, uh, of Schindler's List, which is to say I, I could be that person running around um, during the selection. I could be that person. Um, and the only reason that I'm not there is because there are good people in this world today that are trying to make sure that that's not happening. And the, and the shocking thing is that unfortunately that kind of thing is happening in the world and we need to do more and we as lawyers have a responsibility to try and make sure that, that, uh, that we do the best that we can to create laws and better uh, environments to try and make sure that those things are not happening. And that's what the UN committee is uh, about, what the report that uh, Dan put together is about, what the World Zionists, uh, what the uh, uh, World Jewish Congress is about. And so, you know, that's the c context is key for each of these elements. Like much in life, you know, they can be both used for positive and for negative. So those are just some thoughts that I have about Thank you. the movie. Just a second, and I also share two reports, one that I wrote for Human Rights First on the rise of anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe, and one that I wrote for IJL, which was about Holocaust denial. Uh, there's one more question. Unfortunately, it's going to have to be the last because I hope everyone's finished with their lunches. Um, the next portion is of our uh, Holocaust survivors, and I, I really want to give them time to be able to tell their stories. I don't suppose that people would want to really start munching on anything as, as you hear them speak, and I don't want to tire them out either. So one more question, and then, and then we'll leave it at that.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you to my panelists. Thank you for everyone that's asked questions. Thank you so much. So now I'll ask um, Sammy and Asya to come up, and Bjorn, uh, Mr. Grunwald, please, uh, and, and Sir Scott, please, um, and Carl, Carl and Yehudi. We'll we'll take everybody at once, and we'll have to. I'll have to take maybe another chair. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, not of everybody, but if you will ask a question. Uh, yeah. But you can also talk about your organization. Ask me. Okay. Thank you. Should I stand there? No, I mean when it's my turn. Oh, whatever you like. You can stand as a public speaker. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. I'm sorry? Yes. Pleasure. You? You too. Are you sitting here? Yeah. I'll say, yeah. Well, Somebody else's, yeah. okay? No, uh, that's not you. <laughs> she must have a nameplate. Mm -hmm. I think she has your, your nameplate. Pardon me? Yeah. She has the additional nameplates. Good okay. name. All right, everyone, if, if you could just mosey on back to your spots. Uh, I, I know we, we don't, I want to close out approximately by 3.30, so I want to give everybody due diligence chance to speak <coughs> and to be heard. So please take your seats. Thank you. Uh, where did they put the water? This man? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Pardon me? No, I have. Thank you. So, once again, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. we have panelists. This is the final round. Um, and uh, 
I'd like to start with uh, this side uh, with Sammy Steigman. And Sammy, uh, I know we have a video that we can show. Um, I don't know if yeah. there's anyone up there, but um, yeah, if, if we can. Uh, do you start? <laughs> Six million Jews were killed during the Holocaust. Those who survived had to rebuild their lives, many of them here in the U.S. Now, more than seven decades later, few of them remain. Recently, a New York City photographer set out to take pictures of as many survivors who are still here as possible. The result is a stunning book of portraits that captures the resiliency of their generation. <laughs> Every survivor, if you're going to ask them, how did you survive, everyone will use only one word, and that is luck. There is no rhyme, there is no reason why somebody lived, somebody died. These are the faces of men and women who survived the Holocaust. How did they get there? Where did they come from? That those stories are reflected sometimes in their faces their eyes witnessed unthinkable evil. I don't know it's a curse or a blessing, but I could see it how it was. I remember every little detail. This is a generation growing older. The size of the group is getting smaller. So Brian Marcus decided to capture them in photographs. I think the faces tell their own stories. The photographs themselves um, to me, show resiliency and strength. Brian is known as one of the top wedding photographers in New York City. He's also the grandson of a Holocaust survivor. My grandfather's name was Fred Marcus. He was special in, in, in so many ways, but most importantly, he had just a, a wonderful, boisterous personality. There's definitely something about Fred Marcus that so many people remember, and it's, uh, it's nice that he was, he was mine. Fred was born to a Jewish family in Breslau, Germany in 1910. He grew up as the Nazis rose to power. In 1938, Fred was taken to Buchenwald, a concentration camp in eastern Germany. There was a brief period with anybody who had bookings to go to, I guess, the United States or to Cuba or outside of Germany uh, was let out of the concentration camps depending on what their job was. Fred took a ship bound for Cuba, and when he got there, fell in love with the art of photography. Really started taking pictures of people on the beaches there. All he had was a camera and some, some clothing. Um, had no prior experience. He later made it to New York City, opening Fred Marcus Photography on the Upper West Side. This is nice. Where his son Andy and Brian still work. Fred passed away in 2001. As much time as I spent with him and as close as we were, you know, there was something inside of me that, that really wished that I had spent even more time learning about his story. And so that really inspired me to learn about other people's stories. So to honor his grandfather's memory and generation, Brian started taking photographs of Holocaust survivors and liberators. And just chin down a little bit. We just, uh, through word of mouth, uh, started these sort of these small groups of portrait sessions. And after doing four or five in my own studio, I realized that this was something a little bit more, a little bit more important to go out and, and try to put together a book uh, that had as many survivors that were still here. In the end, he had 167 portraits, all of them featured in a book called Still Here. With everything that they've gone through, they are still here and they'll always be here. My name is Ellie Gross. I was born February 14, 1929, Shimleo Silvani in Romania, and that's northern Transylvania. In 1929 was recession around the world in Romania too, and it was market full with food, but people had no work, no money to buy it, and it was easy to blame the Jews. I was attending kindergarten, and they called me, Dorothy, did you go to Palestine? In September 1939, the Second World War started. For Jews, was every day, the life got worse and worse. In 1942, every man was drafted to forced labor. My father was 36 years old. I never saw him again. In 1944, we had to wear the Yellow Star of David. Jews were beaten, spit, and stoned on the street. 
In April of 1944, Ellie, her mother, and five-year-old brother Adelbert were forced from their home. We had a beautiful house. We had to leave it. I didn't want to leave it. The next month, deportations began. The transport started on May 27 and halted on June 2, 1944. We were seven days with no food and water. I hear all my, the echo, how children were crying for food, and mothers had not even water to give them. There was no place to sit. My mom, I was sitting between mom's legs, and my brother between my leg, and he didn't, I never forgot. He never asked anything. He just was holding my neck, and that's, and how old was he at the time, your brother? Five. He was so cute, little boy. He was so smart. He would have been a genius. The cattle cars arrived at Auschwitz in Poland, the largest Nazi concentration camp in Europe. An estimated 1.3 million people were sent to Auschwitz between May 1940 and May 1945. Over a million were killed. It was such a terrible memory also that when they ordered us to get out. In front of the cattle car was a uh, cart pulled by men, and the dead, the, who couldn't walk, the children, the sick was thrown on top of each other. It was such an awful... Thank you. <laughs> uh, we showed this in the beginning just because we can only document obviously so much in film, uh, and you can see the personal oral history stories of the undeniable fact of what uh, people went through in the Holocaust, so much for Holocaust denial, but here we have Holocaust survivors. This is indisputable. So that's why I will start with you, Sammy, so you can speak a little bit about I am very honored. Uh, to be here with the, the, such a distinguished uh, panel. Uh, I am probably one of the youngest Holocaust survivors you will ever meet. Uh, I was subjected to Nazi medical experimentation. Uh, the side effects, I felt them all my life. Every single day, I will feel them for the rest of my life. The reason that in my particular case, they could not find a cure because it's not localized. I'm suffering from head, neck, shoulders, and back. Uh, at the same time, I never know where the pain will start, how long it will be there, where it will go next, and the intensity okay, can be extremely painful or very mild. On the average, every single second of my life, every day, it's between three and four, but I'm coming from a generation that was very stoic, and you will not see it on my face. Even my closest friends do not know, okay, if I'm in pain or not. At the same time, uh, my life was saved by a German woman. <clears throat> I do not know, uh, the reason is because not far away from the labor camp, there was a farm owned by Germans. She brought food to the guards in the SS, so obviously she had access to the camp and after they finished with the medical experiments. Uh, came a stage that I was dying of starvation. And there are physical signs, big head, swollen stomach, swollen feet. And one day, uh, this German woman, when she saw the physical signs that I'm dying of starvation, at the risk of her entire <coughs> family, she decided to give me milk. I do not know the name of the person that saved my life. I was not able to honor her, but in 2014, I was in Israel, in Jerusalem, at Yad Vashem to give testimony. And, okay, uh, next to the garden, next to the museum, there is a garden honoring 27,000 non-Jewish people that saved Jews. And I saw there a marker honoring the unknown righteous among the nation. That made me very happy because indirectly, the woman that saved my life has been honored. Unlike every other uh, Holocaust survivor, uh, I do not emphasize my personal story. As eloquent as it may be, it's a personal story. What I do is I try to teach the young people, okay, about 
how did the Holocaust happen in genocide? It started the same way with words and bullying. How is it possible that ordinary German people, ordinary people from Europe, from other countries, found that not only acceptable, but required to annihilate one group of people? And normally what I do, I go through uh, about uh, six different stages that as people did not react in time, inappropriately, it kept escalating to a point of no return. And I want the young people to see the signs of today, uh, not to make comparisons with the past, but to learn from history, to educate themselves, and to know how to combat, okay, the hate that is right now prevalent in the United States, that it is also in uh, worldwide, and to know how to combat future tragedies. The other interesting thing is, uh, whether you know it or not, I think uh, you know it, I, I don't, shouldn't say that, but you know it, that Israel is vilified disproportionately at the UN. However, Israel has passed two resolutions. The first one was in November 1st, 2005, which is known today as the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And the second one was last year, at the 80th anniversary of the Vancey Conference. And uh, at the UN, the resolution co-sponsored by Germany, I was very honored to be there, okay, at the historic moment. And that second resolution is combating the Holocaust <coughs> deniers. And we also have to differentiate uh, between uh, Holocaust in genocide, and a lot of people lump them together. Genocide is the murder of a group of people. Holocaust is the annihilation of the group of people, the Jewish people. Okay, and at the same time, we are uh, commemorating today, okay, uh, Yom HaShoah. And uh, in Yom HaShoah, which is our national commemoration of the Holocaust, and it's also uh, promoting heroism. It is the first Hebrew day of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising uh, with the uh, few things that were smuggled into the camp. They were able to resist the mighty German military for 43 days. Finally, the ghetto was completely liquidated. Uh, we also have to understand that people associate resistance only military existence. But I also want you to understand that there are very other forms of resistance. And I'll give you just one example. People were hungry, okay? They were, okay, they were thirsty. They were dying, okay, uh, of starvation. Uh, like, for instance, uh, a man that weighed 180 pounds, if uh, succeeded to, to survive, okay, by the end of the war, they were walking skeletons weighed 65 pounds. And yet, and I'm just giving you one example, and I'm not going into other examples, on Yom Kippur, hungry, okay, thirsty, they fasted. So there are many, many forms of resistance. So therefore, they uh, say, that, well, the Jews went to slaughter like sheep. Please, that's not apply. Uh, I also talk about the connection between the Holocaust and Israel. Uh, during the Holocaust, Jews died because we did not have a country. Next week, we will celebrate our National Memorial Day to remember the people that died for us to have a country. And I also want to understand the importance of the state of Israel. Okay, worldwide. In 2007, uh, 15, because of the rampant violence in France, okay, 8,500 French Jews emigrated to Israel to find a safe haven. Uh, there are many things that we can talk about it, uh, but also what I want to emphasize is uh, the fact that we are a very resilient people. And uh, 
uh, as you saw from the clip, and in the clip, you know, you'll be able to see it on your own, you know, so that is, uh, okay, my story. Uh, it was done by, uh, okay, uh, by an Emmy Award uh, reporter. And uh, all I can say, all I can say, all I want to say is that we have to learn from the past to see the size of today. And, okay, and I want to say that in this country, there is no education. And I, can, I will tell you unequivocally, there is indoctrination. And unfortunately, there are only two countries that have accepted responsibility. Obviously, Germany. And in Germany, they teach it in every school, in every class, in details. One of the things that very few people know that uh, uh, after the Treaty of Versailles, okay, when they had to pay reparation to all the countries they fought against, okay, that caused inflation. And we don't know what inflation is. But to give an example, in 1917, one American dollar was worth four German marks. At the height of the inflation in 1923, one American dollar was worth one trillion. You could have a wheelbarrow full of paper money, you could not buy even a newspaper. Nobody wanted it. They used it to warm themselves in the winter. And what I was very surprised when I was in Germany, and I asked the question, how much was it worth in 1923? The middle grade students knew the answer. And the other country that accepted, to my surprise, a responsibility for its role in the Holocaust was the country where I lived, Romania. About two years ago, I received $238. Financially, did not make a difference. But I was very proud because it showed it was the only other country that took responsibility for their roles in the Holocaust. Uh, I think I will leave it here, okay? So I will give the opportunity to everybody else uh, to say things. But I will be willing to stay here, you know, to answer questions. And also, if anybody has uh, questions after the presentation, okay, I will be more than happy to answer. So I want, again, to thank you. Thank, thank you, you for thank inviting you, me, okay? <laughs> and you. it's a great, great honor for me thank to be here. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I want to um, ask one of our panelists, Scott um, Richmond. Uh, he's uh, from the uh, Anti-Defamation League. And uh, in lieu of all of this and, and everything that we see and what we hear now from, you know, Sammy and the Holocaust survivors and from our previous panel, I'm wondering, since there is an obvious rise in anti-Semitism, and yes, it's been around from pogrom to pogrom and from ages to ages uh, with all sorts of conspiracies and the, the, popul you know, the populist movement and uh, nationalism and all of that, what do you think is fueling this today? And what is your organization doing about it? <laughs> Too loaded one. A small question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm very honored to be here. I'm very honored to, to speak after Sammy. Uh, obviously, an important backdrop for, uh, for the work of ADL. Uh, I actually attended Parade the Musical last night and saw the actual backdrop to, uh, to the reason that ADL was started, the, the terrible persecution of Jews in this country in 1913. Um, so, uh, question of what's fueling this rise in anti-Semitism. Well, first of all, I think it, it should be evident to everybody here that, that there is a rise in anti-Semitism. And I'll just very briefly say that ADL is not about just uh, rhetoric and examples, uh, anecdotal examples, and we're, we're about data. Data drives policy. And uh, you know, just to, to make it clear, there is a rise in anti-Semitism. <clears throat> We've been tracking anti-Semitic incidents since 1979. And in those 43 years, uh, 2022 was the highest year on record. 
Uh, that, that's simply a fact based upon what we've encountered. Uh, our tracking of anti-Semitic incidents is not based upon the sum total of anti-Semitism. It's about the incidents that we've dealt with because ADL, my office, I'm the director for New York and New Jersey, deals with anti-Semitic incidents every single day of the week. Last year, we had over 2,000 incidents reported to my office, and we're one of 25 offices around the country. Uh, and I have a staff who full-time simply respond to anti-Semitic incidents. That's, that's their work. Uh, so that's a piece of what we do in response. Um, I think it's important to note that that rise in anti-Semitic incidents is not since 1979. It's not as if there were one number of anti-Semitic incidents in 79, it was higher in 80, higher in 81. That is not the case. We've seen this rise for the past decade. We track it to 2013. It was mostly stable uh, for the years, uh, the, the earlier years. Uh, but we've seen a steady rise across the nation. It has quintupled since 2013, 500%. If you could think of any societal phenomenon that's gone up 500% and, and the way society responded to it, that's uh, very important to, to think about. Um, in terms of what's fueling this, uh, you know, there are a lot of factors that fuel hate. And I think it's important to say that word hate as opposed to anti-Semitism because we do not live in a vacuum. This isn't just about hate against Jews. Uh, this is about hate against many groups. And that rise in anti-Semitism since 2013 is mirrored by a rise in hate against Muslims, against Asians, against Latinos, against blacks, against the LGBTQ plus community since 2013. Uh, you, can, you can look at all sorts of, uh, of uh, indicators of this, FBI hate crimes data, for example. Uh, it's a very important, and the factors that are fueling this rise in hate are not necessarily specific to the Jewish community, although uh, we can talk about the sort of history of anti-Semitism, and uh, it's, it's found another nice home with this rise in hate uh, in the past few years. So what are some of those factors? Well, um, look, there's, there's many factors. Obviously, the past few years, stresses on society, people look for scapegoats the economy or COVID or whatever it happens to be. But if we're talking about a 10-year phenomenon, we're talking about something that's, that's much longer than that. You heard some of them in the past panel. Obviously, social media is one of those factors. It's an enormous driver of hate. Uh, it gives haters a megaphone, a megaphone that they, they never had before. Um, it gives them an ability to find others who share their hateful views, and it gives them an ability to radicalize others who may not share their hateful views but are susceptible to it. I spent three days in Buffalo following the horrific tragedy there last May, and I spent a lot of that time in front of the media, in front of elected officials, in front of law enforcement who all asked me, how does somebody who was not going down this path become so radicalized that they decide to seek out black people and and shoot them. Uh, you know, it's, it's a horrific phenomenon, and that's what we're dealing with. Um, the second factor I would point to is um, polarization, uh, polarization of our society. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to control hate when people are divided. Traditionally, hate is controlled by civil society. Civil society pushing hate to the margins and saying, this is not acceptable. You don't belong in mainstream society. Your views do not belong here, and it's pushed to the margins of society. But when people take sides, they say, what happens on my side is right, and what happens on your side is wrong, and they're not going to give a benefit to the other side. They're going to excuse the hate that exists on their side so as not to give a benefit. Only people on the left can control hate on the left, and the same on the right. And if people take sides like this, Hate begins to move towards the center. You need a strong center in order to control hate, and that center has weakened in uh, the past few years. And the third thing I'd point to is a general emboldening of extremists, which goes along with this polarization. We've seen in the past few years extremist points of view on both the left and the right uh, becoming much more pronounced, society not feeling uh, or not being able to put the same sort of uh, censure on, uh, on extremists. They don't feel the same uh, compulsion to resist the kinds of things that, that they do and say. Uh, and this goes along with, uh, with this idea of civil society pushing hate to the margins. I can point to one report that ADL puts out. It's called the White Supremacist Propaganda Report. 
So in uh, 2017, we began tracking white supremacist propaganda. These are stickers and flyers and banner drops uh, that white supremacists use as a tool. And in New York State, in 2017, there were 20 such instances of white supremacist propaganda. That's increased more than tenfold since. Um, people just don't feel the same sort of censure. The, a few weeks ago, this National Day of Hate that was sponsored by the, the Goyim Defense League, Goyim Defense League, a white supremacist, really anti-Semitic white supremacist organization uh, that's responsible for a huge increase in white supremacist propaganda. Uh, is one of these organizations, although there are many. Uh, they're the ones who, who dropped the banner over the freeway, the 405, that said Kanye was right about the Jews. And right next to that, their streaming site, so that you, you will go and, and look at their streaming site, which has 24-7 anti-Semitic content. Uh, and also, uh, they monetize hate. So you can find sweatshirts and t-shirts with anti-Semitic content there. They sell soap with swastikas on it, whatever, whatever you're looking for. Um, in terms of ADL, what ADL is doing about it, so ADL is an organization, as I said, was founded in 1913, not a, not a young organization. Uh, we were founded with a, a sort of a clear um, a mission, a, an understood mission, and what I would call a radical mission. That clear mission was to, to deal with the issue of anti-Semitism in this country. Uh, people were, uh, were obviously very concerned, but uh, we were also founded with the mission to uh, pursue justice for all. Uh, this is the second part of our mission that it took us many years to really begin to effectuate. It wasn't really till the civil rights movement that ADL be began effectuating that other part of our mission, and now we talk a lot about the fact that we fight against anti-Semitism, we take the lead when it comes to issues of anti-Semitism, but when it comes to issues of hate against all other communities, we play a very important allyship role. As a 110-year-old organization, we have a huge number of resources to offer in the fight against hate. There is no other organization quite like ADL, whose sole mission it is to combat hate, to do something about hate, and we offer those resources readily to many other organizations. Uh, some of the things that we do, we have something called the Center for Technology and Society. This is the part of ADL that fights hate in digital spaces. It's basically our office in Silicon Valley. These are people who've come from Reddit and Facebook and Twitter and companies like that. They're, they're concerned about what's going on and want to give back. They offer technological solutions, and they have contacts at the top levels of those companies. Um, we, so a very, very innovative part of what we do. Secondly, we're very data-driven. Our Center on Extremism is all about uh, supplying the data. This annual audit of anti-Semitic incidents is, is part of what we do, but we also have threat intelligence analysts, about 40 of them, who are following bad actors through social media, like these white supremacists, and supplying tips to law enforcement. Last year, we supplied over 2,000 tips to law enforcement in this country. We're very much the intelligence arm of the American Jewish community. Uh, we also are very much in the trenches. Uh, we're not just an organization that speaks out. So like I mentioned, we are responding to anti-Semitic incidents literally, literally every day of the week, working with law enforcement, working with uh, universities or social media or workplace or wherever that anti-Semitism happens to be taking place, and uh, working with victims uh, every day. Uh, the last thing I would mention is that ADL, uh, in addition to this sort of reactive work uh, or this sort of work along the spectrum from reactive to proactive, the most proactive thing that we do is education. When we talk about ways to combat anti-Semitism, most important way to combat anti-Semitism is to change hearts and minds. Legislation is good, all these kinds of acts are, are, are good, but it's only changing hearts and minds that's going to do something about anti-Semitism or all forms of hate, and that's about education. So ADL does an enormous amount of anti-bias, anti-bullying, anti-hate, anti-anti-Semitism, Holocaust education in the schools. Last year, we touched more than four million students across this country. Uh, I'm the director for New York and New Jersey. We work in 400 schools in New York and New Jersey currently, and we should be working in thousands of schools. A lot of this is free, these resources. If you know any teachers, if you know any administrators, let them know how important it is to engage in anti-bias work in the schools, creating a future where people respect one another and celebrate difference and celebrate diversity is the way to, uh, to create a, a better future. Thank you.
Thank you to Scott and thank you for all the work that ADL does. And of course, it's not just about legislation and policy. It's certainly about people caring and people stepping up to the plate on, on all forms of racism. And when you talked about the, um, uh, the white supremacists and soap, it reminded me of, of something I saw recently again on Benjamin Ferenz when he said that he saw children being burned um, by, the, by the Nazis and part of the lard was made into soap. So that there's that image there. So we commend you for the work that we do. One second. Um, so I'll, I'll get back to you. Yeah. If you uh, wanted to say something. Okay. Oh, yeah. I just want to make one comment, something that very few people know. Okay. And uh, this is in 2013. I was completely shocked to learn something from the two, from two articles. One was in Daily Mail in London, one in New York Times. The Nazis and their collaborators had 42,500 different type of camps. Only six were actually dead camps. Okay, uh, in the meantime, they have discovered additional uh, camps. There is, the, the number has risen to over 44,000, and uh, the books are open. Unfortunately, we will never know the full extent of what happened because we do not have enough people to do the research. Thank you for allowing us. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to now invite uh, um, a member of the United Nations Committee that works with me, Carl, part of the younger generation, but he also has something to say about the Holocaust that has touched his life personally. So, Carl, please. Thank you, Sophia. Good afternoon. My name is Carl Fisher, and as Sophia that said, I'm a member of the United Nations Committee at the New York City Bar Association. I'm also an attorney for the city of New York. It's a privilege to be on this panel and to have a platform to draw attention to the alarming and documented trend of anti-Semitism and hate against, under, against underrepresented groups in countries across the globe, but also here in the United States. My connection to the Holocaust is through my grandfather, Arnold Fuchs. He's a Holocaust survivor. Before I talk about his story, I just want to note one of the themes of this panel, as the title indicates, is to sound the siren. As other members of the panel have, have referenced, there are multiple meanings, but the meaning that I gravitated towards was the one to act as a warning. To raise the alarm is an incredibly important right now as we sit here in 2023, nearly 90 years since the Holocaust occurred. As 90 years has passed, it is inevitable that our physical connection to the people with firsthand experience to the Holocaust become less and less, and the consequence of forgetting this time in history becomes more and more likely. In an effort to never forget, I'll now briefly share a little bit of my grandfather's story. He was from a town in eastern Germany called Breslau, much like from the video that we just watched, in fact. I was slightly surprised. Um, Breslau was relinquished to Poland in 1944, and it's now known as Rotslav. My grandfather's family was Jewish. His father worked as a sales representative for a garment manufacturer and his mother was a hairdresser. My grandfather and grandparents were soon targeted in their hometown and at their work by the National Socialist German Workers' Party, more commonly referred to as the Nazi Party, led by Adolf Hitler. My family, as many Jewish people were, dealt with increasingly oppressive laws that were aimed at depriving the Jewish population of their liberties and their freedoms. Those targeted laws, the rhetoric, and the acts of hate against the Jewish people came to an overt head on the night of November 9th and early in the morning of November 10th, 1938, known as Kristallnacht. Jewish businesses were attacked and many Jews were arrested and put into concentration camps. This would be the case for many of my grandfather's family members, aunts, uncles, and cousins, some of whom perished in those camps. 
My grandfather and his family were able to avoid arrest that night, and they soon took steps to leave Germany. In 1939, my grandfather and his parents secured passage by train to Trieste, Italy. Once there, they took a boat named the Conte Rosso to Shanghai, China. They would be Jewish refugees in China until 1950, living in what is known as the Shanghai Ghetto. Uh, there were approximately 20,000 Jewish refugees that lived in Shanghai and in China through the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Eventually, my grandfather emigrated to the United States. That was in 1951. He was first denied access uh, due to a deficiency in his entry visa that required him to return to Germany before he was admitted entrance to the United States. The rest, as they say, at least for my grandfather's story, is history. But now as we sit here amongst a rise in documented anti-Semitism, it is ever so important that we do not forget our history and the atrocities of the past. And we must do this in order to prevent it from repeating again. So what can we do to prevent another Holocaust? I implore everyone to speak up against hate and anti-Semitism. Involve yourself in the community. Join civic organizations and vote for your elected officials. We've heard here today how important that the laws are, how important it is to push anti-Semitism anti and hate to the fringes and, and eradicate it altogether. But we have to hold our lawmakers accountable and we have to be responsible for putting in the right lawmakers. That is how I think that we can get to a more just and fair society and we can make a society where hate and racism and bigotry no longer have a place. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, nothing like a personal story, but throughout generations. Um, obviously, this touches everybody's lives. I'd like to uh, invite uh, Bjorn uh, Grunwald to speak about his experience. First of all, I would like to thank <clears throat> Sadja Pendelstein, who sits there all the way in the back, who introduced me to this committee, in particular to <clears throat> Sofia uh, Muraskowski, and I want to thank her for having invited me today. I feel very honored to be here today. The issues that we are dealing with and the questions that we're dealing with are questions that were posed. Can one be a believing Jew after the Holocaust? And really, can one be a, a believer at all? Where was God during the Holocaust? How can one have faith in humanity? And then how does the search of anti-Semitism reflect an ingrained pattern? I would like to go in some depth into this ingrained pattern. There is no simple solution to the big argument of a loving God <clears throat> who allows suffering, only atheists seem to have simple answers. The British evolutionary biologist, author and atheist, Richard Dawkins from Oxford University wrote a book called The Selfish Gene. According to Dawkins, the universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt other people are going to get lucky. And you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at the bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. The DNA just is, and we dance to its music. 
Dawkins concludes, not only is there no basis for morality, but that ultimately there is no such thing as morality. Please notice that Dawkins' explanation does not remove suffering. It still exists. Even worse, it removes all hope. Dawkins' view is very bleak, but it doesn't mean it's false, but it doesn't mean it's true either. It ought to create a huge conflict within every person who still believes in a God. If God is good and all-powerful, he should, could, would probably do this or do that. But he doesn't. So therefore, there is no God. That's the simplistic conclusion we hear all the time. But it doesn't solve the nagging God question. The fact is that life is full of suffering. Evil is lurking in many unexpected places and pain is everywhere. Are there any grounds that could give confidence and trust in a God? Are there any hidden answers waiting to be discovered somewhere? Are well-founded answers even feasible? Could I personally solve this problem? After all, I have spent most of my life solving problems, mostly in science and technology many of which resulted in patents. While living in Sweden, I solved problems which resulted in European and US patents. The company I worked for licensed those patents rights to, the US, to a US company which brought me to Pennsylvania to teach the technology. The old nagging question about a loving God followed me all the way to the United States. There have been times that I rejected everything about God and especially his chosen people, the Jews. Since early childhood, the shame of being a stateless and identityless Jew was deeply carved into my mind. I was obsessed with dark and lugubrious thoughts. I was a brooding and embittered child. There was nobody to talk to. Nobody would understand. I was well into my 50s before this spell, initially so slightly, started somewhat to alleviate. My family had lived for more than 400 years as Sephardic Jews in the Netherlands. Since their expulsion from Spain in 1492, I asked myself how my family, as God's chosen people, who were virtually all murdered during the Holocaust, could be so inextricably linked to a loving God. So where can we find the next Alexander the Great who can cut this Gordian knot? Many people in the sectarian community in which I grew up had, of course, all the answers. They said, 2,000 years ago, your ancestors cried out, his blood is on us and our children. Do the death camps stand there today as a witness of how his blood is on my ancestors' children? After all, I am one of those children. My rebuttal of Ezekiel 18 chapter 18, verse 20, about the sins of the fa fathers, fell on deaf ears. It starts with, the one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, etc. They then told me that the covenant between Abraham and God is rescinded. It's null and void. God changed his mind. The Jews have fallen under the heavy wrath of God, and rather the Gentiles than the Jews should attain the kingdom of heaven. Lovely, isn't it? I refuted their argument by quoting their revered apostle Paul's greatest work, namely his letter to the Romans. He wrote, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First, he says, the Jew. Mind you, first the Jew, then to the Gentile. Their response was not unexpected. You Jews can't understand the Holy Scriptures unless you first believe in Christ. Unbeknownst to most, these words are rooted in the so-called adversus judeos literature of the early church fathers. The Latin word means against the Jews. Cyprian, the bishop of Carthage in the third century, wrote and explained to his son Quirinus the very basis of anti-Semitism. It was an exegesis of hatred against the Jewish people. Cyprian wrote three books of testimonies against the Jews, in which he depicted the history of the Jewish people 
as a conglomeration of crimes. These testimonies became an intrinsic part of Christian dogma for the next 2,000 years. Some of it is still taught in many churches today. In 1982, two volumes were published with the name Christian Theology After Auschwitz. An end or a new beginning? A new beginning, question mark. They were the result of extensive research of 2,000 years of anti-Semitism by the Dutch theologian Jan Hansen. He described in no uncertain term how Christianity is responsible for modern anti-Semitism. The early church fathers' literature against the Jews has established the foundation of many of the variants of what is called the catechesis of vilification. Catechesis is oral <coughs> instruction, usually in the doctrines of Christianity. From the moment the church became the official state religion, this tradition of vilification became the basis of ecclesiastical anti-Judaism. The Catholic scholar and theologian Rosemary Ruther in her book Faith and Fatricide points out the adversus Judeus literature was not created to convert Jews or even primarily to attack Jews, but to affirm the identity of the church, which could only be done by invalidating the identity of the Jews. Hansen wrote that the religious legitimacy of all forms of anti-Semitism anywhere in the world never came from City Hall or from the streets of Alexandria, and neither from the Roman barracks. Instead, it came from the basilicas and the Christian churches that Christians swarmed together around the crucified Christ. During the ages, 96 councils and 114 popes formulated laws to disparage and ridicule the Jewish people to torture and to ban them, to confiscate their property and to regard them as pariahs of society. As the Jewish historian Raul Hilberg wrote, Christian Europe offered to Jews three alternatives. The missionaries of Christianity had said, in effect, you have no right to live among us as Jews. The secular rulers who followed had complained, you have no right to live among us. The German Nazis at last decreed, you have no right to live, period. The German Nazis then didn't begin a development, they completed it. I want you to understand that what you just heard is barely the tip of the iceberg. So let's now look at the question, how could a loving God allow this all to happen? During my life, I've noticed that people who believed that the Jewish rabbi Jesus was the promised Messiah had a much easier time cope, uh, coping with the question than those who did not believe. I spent many years exploring the disparity. It is a question of living at peace with oneself, having some happiness in life, versus a life filled with nothing but agony. <clears throat> Christianity notwithstanding, what, what is it? that this historical figure, Jesus, can cause such a difference in a person's outlook on life after a Holocaust experience. I've many times questioned whether my observations are valid or not, but they were always strongly confirmed. Okay. It became clear to me that one group of people can reconcile the concept of a loving God during the Holocaust, while the other cannot. Both Christians and Jews insist that their religious view is settled dogma and not subject to any further discussions. The same arguments are heard daily on the news, a statement such as, it's settled science. There is a consensus of the majority of scientists. Well, the reality is that these statements are always political. They serve someone's agenda. First of all, no science is ever settled. That is a hoax. New discoveries occur all the time. The nature of all scientific investigation is to question everything old and new. Second, science can be done by consensus. That would turn it into political science, which by definition is not a science because it cannot comply with the scientific method, a methodology that was established by the 17th century English philosopher and statesman Francis Bacon. Criticism is the very backbone of scientific method. Third, 
The so-called majority of scientists are usually social scientists who lack the prerequisite expertise in the natural and physical sciences. The same reasoning applies to religion, even though most theologians and religious scholars don't seem to adhere to that. The people who best can cope with the question, where was God, are people who believe that the God of Israel encoded himself into humanity. They became to believe that Jesus was actually God incarnate, who ended up on a cross. But what in the world is the God of Israel doing on a cross, one might ask? At the very least, it tells them that God has not remained distant from the problem of suffering, but became part of it. They believe that he died and rose on the third day. It means to them a beginning of things where death is not the end. They believe that there is a God who is the creator and who is going to judge the world one day by the man who he has appointed by raising him from the dead. It is that confidence and hope that enables these people to trust God with the outcome. The human heart cries out for justice. In Richard Dawkins' worldview, there exists no ultimate justice, and therefore most people who have ever lived or will live <clears throat> would never get justice. They don't get it in this life, and there is no next life to get it. Atheism is literally hopeless. Here's where it all starts to make sense. It is about hope and transcendence, something that lies beyond the limits of ordinary experience which reconciles the big questions I have struggled with most of my life. The elaboration of politics and power within the Christian church notwithstanding, I came to believe that these people may have found hope and faith that is grounded both in history and in experience, which means he, uh, there is hope for all of humanity. You may find that very difficult, and you may find it absolutely incredible that a scientist and a Jew belief in this kind of a message of hope. But my life has been a journey of hope, belief, and expectation from the day I fled the Netherlands to Sweden, then my subsequent arrival in the United States, and to this day while standing here in front of you. It repudiated victimhood and gave me aspiration and made me grateful for the life that was given me. And finally, I would like to leave behind something for you to think about. It is a quote from John Lennox, an emeritus professor of mathematics at Oxford University, who said, I firmly believe that if you could see what God does with the innocent who have suffered, you would have no more questions. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. so much, Professor. That was a great deal of um, philosophy and psychology. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would like to call up uh, Yehudit Barsky, who is a, a member of the MENA committee here um, at the New York City Bar. Thank you. Um, I realize that uh, I am I'm the last speaker, and it's hard to. Oh, we have one last. Or one last. Okay. 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 So then, Aharon Aharon Chaviv, the last one is uh, is the most desired. So it's not it's not me. Um, so I just would like to uh, first. I'm I'm a Middle East uh, specialist. I'm not a lawyer, uh, but that has taken me on on a journey which I wanted to share with you this afternoon, but briefly. But before I do that, I'd like to dedicate this presentation in memory of all of the victims, both the Jewish victims of the Holocaust as well as all of the other innocent victims. Uh, and as well, in honor and in memory of my, of my father-in-law, uh, Walter Neumann, who is a survivor of one of the Vichy uh, French camps in, in uh, Les Milles, who escaped three times and also operated in the underground to save other Jews. So I'd like to just mention, mention him, and I would also like to mention the fact that he never gave up and was a very happy person despite what happened to him and despite all of the things that he saw. And he would always say, there are good people and there are bad people. There were even 
some Nazis who saved my life, and, I, and I'm grateful to them as well as, as well as all of the other people that I dealt with. So I always like, always like to mention the things that he went through, that he remembered both of them, and those, those were both very important to him. This year, there is a, a, a new delegation at the March of the Living, and may, many of you may know what that is. So the March of the Living is a, is a delegation to Poland that marches uh, uh, to Auschwitz, and a group, of Jew, a group of Jews, young Jews from different movements all over the world, young Israelis, um, as well as Holocaust survivors, as well as diplomats and dignitaries. Um, this year, there was an unusual delegation of people who were survivors of the Holocaust from Tunisia. And for most people, the idea that there is a, a Holocaust in North Africa, that there, were, that there were camps in North Africa, and that there were Nazis in the Middle East is something that is relatively little known and, and up until the last 20 years, not very well researched. So what I'm sharing with you today is based on the uh, 15 to 20 years of uh, research into Nazi archives as well as other work that has been done in, in British archives and, and American archives by historians, uh, some, of, some of whom are European historians, others of whom are um, American and British um, who are able to read the various languages, and uh, some as well are Middle Eastern uh, um, specialists. So I'm, I'm a Middle East specialist, and I've been curious about this particular uh, issue for quite some time. So this delegation of, of people who are representing their, some of them are their parents and grandparents and some are Holocaust survivors who survived Tunisia, for many of us would be per perhaps a curiosity. And I'd like to bring to light today what, what was the background of the Holocaust in the Middle East and North Africa. So in 1942, the, the Allies were, de were defeated in Tobruk, in Libya, which led the Nazis to believe that they were going to make a, an immediate conquest of Egypt, that they were going to pass El Alamein, and they were going to go on to Cairo. And their, their, the concept was that, and again, we, are for, we, we have forgotten, we keep using the word world war, but in truth, we need to think about that. It really was a world war. And, and the idea that the Nazis had, and this is in the, in the uh, archives of, of the uh, Nazi era uh, that have been researched by a number of scholars recently, that first they were going to conquer Eastern Europe and then continue down, continue through Eastern Europe, down through Turkey, down through Syria, and meet the other <coughs> Nazi army coming from North Africa, which would, which would land in, in, um, in Tunisia, go through Morocco, go through Libya, go through Egypt, and meet in the Middle East. And the way that the Nazis believed that they were going to conquer and have their, their empire was the way one wages war. And essentially, there are many aspects of that, but part of, a course, part of that, of course, was military, sorry, military, um, military actions. So that was, the, that was a concept that they had. They were stopped, uh, they were, we, as, as many people may remember, they were stopped at El Alamein. But until El Alamein, there was, a, there was activity that was being planned for North Africa. So let me start, before go, going further into the, the, uh, the war, uh, the actual military activities of the war, the, the, the Nazi regime believed in trying to engage and trying to subvert all of the other br uh, colonies, the British colonies, the French colonies, etc., throughout the world. And they, they, in, they, they invested in broadcasting, which was the social media of that time. They invested in pamphlets. In 1933, which is very early on, but in 1933 and, and 34, they started to distribute Mein Kampf, Hitler's uh, declaration of what he believed that that he wanted to do in Arabic throughout the Arab, throughout the Arab world. Now you might think, and this is, seems like a questionable thing, how is it that, that they could believe that distributing Mein Kampf was going to attract Arabs when Nazis believed that Jews and Arabs and others are quote unquote lesser than them, subhuman, etc. Well, 
there was, a, there was an attraction to the Middle East and to the Arab world. There was an attraction to the strength of the fact you had people in, in the Arab world who, um, due to their history, were very strong in their religion. And there was this attraction in, in the idea that they were going to motivate Muslims uh, to adhere and, and believe in Nazi ideology. So this was an investment in, in, in basically uh, reaching out to the Muslim world. This was as well uh, an investment, there was a, as well an, an investment in uh, radio broadcast. So not everyone had a radio, but radio was a, a force multiplier. If one person had a radio, they would, they would take notes and they would pass it on to other people or they would invite other people to come and listen to the radio. A cafe was also a force multiplier. People came to the cafe, it was a radio in the cafe. They would hear the broadcast, the Nazi broadcast, and then pass it on to others. So you get, basically, that was the social media of, of the 20th century. Um, going on from that, there was subversion. The idea that you would get people to organize themselves to help, uh, uh, to help the Nazi army once it would arrive in, in the Middle East, I'm sorry, in, in North Africa and in the Middle East to be able to subvert the British and the French uh, when, the French, when, when the French were free. So there were all of these things going on prior to the arrival of uh, Nazi, actual Nazi forces in North Africa and, and moving toward the Middle East. But before we get there, uh, what were they planning to do with, with the Jews? And this is where there, there are intersectional points between what happened in Eastern Europe and what, ha what, what was planned for uh, the Middle East and North Africa. So in Eastern Europe, I'm sure you may all remember that uh, there, were, there were people who, there were, by the time of this period, this is 1941, there were one million Jews who had already been killed on the Eastern Front. Um, half of them in what uh, Father Patrick Desbois calls the Holocaust by bullets, where they would round Jews up and take them to, take them to the forest and shoot them. And then the other half, they started to use, the Nazis started to use um, uh, vans with gas to, uh, to, murder, to murder people. So these were mobile vans that they were, they were taking around Eastern Europe and they started to use that method. So this is something that they had already created and they were willing to bring to other places and they handpicked a group of people from the Einsatzkommando of Eastern, that they had already used in Eastern Europe. They were, they were about to send them to North Africa uh, when, they first, uh, when they first arrived in North Africa in Tunisia. Um, but the, but the, the, they were bogged down, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they were bogged down and the problem that they had in, was that they were not able to get enough fuel in order for their troops to continue on. Plus, of course, they were having a hard time fighting the British. So despite having won in Tobruk, they were bogged down at that point. So they, they, the plan for this group, there was a special group of this Einsatzkommando uh, whose operations were called quote unquote executive operations. These were the, these were the people who led, the group, who were in charge of, the, of uh, killing Jews en masse in Eastern Europe. So a group was brought uh, together and they originally were going to be sent to Egypt. They, they, they had thought that that was where they were the first place where they were going to uh, make their, uh, to uh, invade uh, North Africa. But because of the delay, they were sent instead to Athens. So this group, according to the Nazi archives, was, was going to be sent to Egypt after, uh, after they hoped they were going to defeat the British, to Egypt, and then to Palestine, and then to Syria, and then as well to Iraq where there were other Jews. And essentially, this was the way that they were going to achieve the annihilation of all of Jews in, in, the, in the area of, of the Mediterranean basin. So, um, I just, so I'm sorry, we, uh, we don't have it. Uh, okay. All right, so I, I'm sorry, I had a picture for you of, um, oh, thank you so much, okay. <laughs> so what happened to, so, uh, so one second, <clears throat> excuse me.
there were 500,000 Jews in North Africa, and there were another 500,000 Jews in Palestine at that time. And essentially, these, were, these, were, these communities had not yet, by 1942, had not yet, uh, uh, had not yet been, I'm oh, sorry, not by 1942, a little bit earlier. These, are, these were communities that were, that were being targeted, that would have been targeted by Nazi-era laws, as well as eventual annihilation had, had the, the battle gone another way in El, in El Alamein. So, in looking at, at these communities, each one, each one of them in different countries, there were different experiences because first you had uh, the Jews who were under French rule, and when the Vichy French uh, took over in France, there were different, there were different laws. So in, in the French-controlled areas, which were um, Tunisia and, and Morocco and Algeria, you had the Statut des de Juifs, the Jewish laws, Jewish statutes, which were enacted in, in Vichy, France, which, of course, affected the Jews in France, but also affected Jews in those three countries. And in those three countries, there were different, there were different things that happened, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a rather complicated to get into everything. But in, it, just in essence, just to give you a taste of what was going on, um, in Algeria, where the Jews were very, very assimilated and they had been given French uh, citizenship, they had somewhat of a similar experience to the Jews in France where they were marginalized and marginalized and marginalized and eventually totally taken out of uh, society and, and persecuted. And, um, and I'll, get, I'll get to how they're persecuted in a moment. And then in, in Morocco and in Tunisia, you had the, the, uh, the local uh, Muslim rulers who were in some way in name only ru ruling their countries, but they still were in, in some way in charge. So the, the ruler of Morocco, Mohammed V, and the ruler of, uh, of, of Tunisia, uh, the Bey, both of them delayed uh, the enactment of some of these rulings uh, to, the, to the degree that they could. But when, when there was a call to move all of the Jews out of the cities and, and back into the ghettos where essentially this is the same type of thing you, uh, you would hear in, in Europe, that Jews were forced into a ghetto. Well, there were still ancient ghettos in these countries, so they were forced back into the melah of the, of the, uh, in, in their countries where uh, there were too many people crowded in and people starved and, and there was typhus, etc. Similar to um, ghettos that we, the, the type of situation in Europe. So let me get to um, the, um, the camps, and this is something that, again, it's a little, somewhat, a little bit different in, in different places, but again, the fact that, uh, first of all, in, in the, the only country where the Nazis actually uh, were in charge of camps was Tunisia, and the other countries were still under uh, Vichy uh, control, so things, and, I'm sorry, excuse me, and or Italian control which was Libya. So you had somewhat different situations in each of those countries. I don't have time to get into everything uh, that happened there, but this is a picture uh, you can see of um, uh, people going to a work camp. And the idea that the, the Nazis had to help their war effort, we, we, pro we probably are cognizant of the fact that a lot of uh, the, the, uh, the work that people did in, in labor camps in Europe were, were to help the Nazi war effort. In, uh, in North Africa, the idea was to help them uh, obviously defeat the British, but also there were fortifications that needed to be built. And they also became very interested in building the Trans-Sahara uh, Railroad because they believed that if they had that railroad, the French had started it, but they had not completed it. So they, they wanted to restart it again in order to be able to uh, traverse the Sahara and get um, uh, fuel and as well Africans to work it for, as slave labor uh, for them as well. So they were not averse to bringing sub-Saharan Africans into this, um, and, and, they, and they brought many people to their camps. Any, anyone who came in contact with the Nazi forces were in those camps and were, and were not, not just Jewish people. So the, the slave labor that they, that they were uh, engaging with were for, was for the purpose of the victory of the, the Nazi forces in North Africa. 
Um, not all of it was as organized uh, as it was in Europe. Again, they're operating on foreign soil, but nevertheless, this was part of the, part of what they what they expect, what they were aspiring to do. So th there's a group of, of uh, workers. Uh, I'm sorry, of, uh, this, of of Jews who were being sent to uh, slave labor camps uh, in Tunisia. Uh, there were five thousand. Uh, there were 5,000 Jews who were, who were sent to forced labor in Tunisia during that time. And the, the eventual plan was for the Jews of Tunisia to be deported by ship to be sent to actual death camps in Europe. So this, this was part of the plan. There were actually a handful of Jews who were sent back to Europe and did die in, um, in, uh, in death camps. Uh, but most of what was done, it was done in North Africa itself. Um, in Morocco, there were 2,100 Jews who were forced uh, to, pro to provide slave labor, and they worked on the Trans-Sahara rail system. Uh, in um, in uh, Libya, there were 2,600 who were, who were expelled from their homes to the Jado camp in the desert. And they were given, each of them were given 150 grams of bread, and they were told, uh, the, purpose, the purpose of you being here is to starve you. So you can imagine just that small amount of bread. And I just wanted to add, um, there is a particular type of torture. There are many, many tortures, but there's a particular type of torture that they would use in the Sahara, in these, in these camps, which were in the desert. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're not near the cities. Uh, one was called Le Tombeau, the tomb. It was a grave dug in the ground, two meters long, 40 centimeters deep, and 60 centimeters wide. Men under punishment are confined to this tomb for various periods. The minimum sentence was eight days and nights. The maximum survived was 17 days and nights. In this case, the victim was a Polish Jew named Rosenberg. Typical of the offenses which carried a man a stretch of, of Le Tambo was that of the German Jew, Selgo. Like all of the others, he had to lie face up night and day he had no covering, only a tattered Legion uniform, meaning French Legion uniform, with no underclothes. He was not allowed to move or change positions in the tumble. An Arab was posted over the graves to see that the victim stayed rigidly still. The only occasion when a man was allowed to raise his head a little was after a rainstorm when the graves filled with water. Then he was allowed a stone for a headrest to save him from drowning. As the subsoil was clay, the water would take three days to drain away. So you get the idea. This is again in the in the in the in the desert in the Sahara, with extreme temperatures of the day and extreme temperatures at night, and anyone who is subjected to this, uh, many 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 of them died. So let me just uh, for let me just speak about the uh, other areas where there was activity. Um, outside of North Africa, if we, if we go further into, into the Middle East, uh, during that period, the Saudi, the Saudi king uh, offered the use of, of Saudi Arabia as a way station for Nazi weaponry shipments to Palestine or any, or any other place that would, would help them to be able to conquer the region. And there were British reports of, of how, how in, in Palestine, again, this is under British rule, how serious and how severe the uh, people actually were excited. They believed that they were going to see the Nazi army come and liberate them from the British. So they gave Hitler a special name, like an honorific, as if he had gone on the, on the, on the pilgrimage to Mecca. They called him Hajj Nimr, the, the, uh, the, one, the one who made the Hajj, this, is, this uh, particular honorific the tiger, and they were very, very anticipatory and excited for him, for, for Hitler, and, or particularly the Nazi army and Rommel to come uh, and liberate them from the British. So according to one of the uh, British reports at the time, enthusiasm, excuse me, uh, according to one of the, the uh, Nazi uh, intelligence reports at the time, enthusiasm for our Führer and the new, Ger the new Germany is is probably so widespread because the Palestinian Arabs in their struggle for existence long for an Arab Führer. So they were maybe projecting a, a bit there, but there was such admiration for Nazi Germany at that time. And because of their fight against the Jews, they sense that they share a common single front with the, with the Germans. 
There was a British report uh, in, uh, with regard to uh, Iraq describing, uh, describing that the Arabs have an unshakable faith that the Germans, meaning the Nazis, will be victorious. The German shortwave broadcasts are listened to only by a small number, but their content soon makes the rounds of the Arab people. It is exaggerated, embellished in an oriental manner to the point where the original text can hardly be recognized. So just to speak about uh, a, different, a different case, which was uh, Iraq, uh, it, it, there was a, a coup in Iraq in 1941 carried out by four generals who overthrew the, the, the uh, British control at that time. And they were helped by Hajjim al Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, who was also, uh, he lived, he was exiled to Baghdad at that time. And there was an incredible amount of anti-Jewish and, and Nazi propaganda in, in the streets and in, in the culture of, of Iraq at that time. So that is, that is the, that one of the reasons that they were able to, uh, to carry out the coup. The Nazi regime, uh, the, again, this is according to the, the reports uh, that have now been unearthed, they actually provided arms that were flown to Iraq in unmarked planes to help out with, uh, with this coup. And from, uh, from April through June, so up until uh, June 1st of uh, 1941, the, the junta was in power. At that point, the British decided that they wanted to, that they, that they could not keep this going. Um, okay. The British decided they could not, that they could not <coughs> let this continue, so they, they, um, there was a counter coup by, by the British, but the British did not want to make it look like they were the ones who were uh, carrying out the coup. They wanted Iraqi soldiers to be in charge and, and bring the uh, Iraqi regent back to Iraq. Because of that, they stayed outside of the cities of Basra and outside of Baghdad, and Massacres ensued in both of those cities. In, in Baghdad, there were 150, between 150 and 180 Jews who were killed, uh, 600 who were injured, and there, were, there was an unknown number of women who were, who were raped at the time. And uh, this, this pogrom, we would call a pogrom, uh, was called the, the Farhud, and this was the, uh, the, the very brief uh, Nazi control over, over Iraq. So I'd like to um, just, again, I just wanted to give you a taste of, of what happened in this period and to, just to bring it back to the connections between uh, Jews in Europe and, and Jews in, in North Africa. Uh, this is, there were, there were um, Megillot, like a, a scroll of Esther that were published in the 1940s and 1950s that commemorated the Holocaust by, by Eastern European Jews, or, or I should say Jews, um, uh, Ashkenazi Jews. Um, but this is an interesting example. This one is from North Africa. Uh, it says, Megillah Hamil Hama the Yisrael, the, 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 the Megillah of the war in Israel. And it has a regular scroll of Esther in there uh, for, the, the, for the holiday of Purim, but it's comparing the holiday of Purim to World War II. And it, it essentially, uh, it says, Nitzachon ba'alei brit v'harusim ha'adirim, the victory of the, of the allies and, and the Russians, uh, the, 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 uh, the glorious, uh, you may be referring to them as glorious, Al um, Hafascistim against the Nazi fascists, and then it describes. Uh, it says Nifilat Germania, the Hitler Ha'avur. Excuse me. It's the uh, the fall of the fall of Hitler. Um, the, the, uh, and it celebrates the fall of Hitler, and essentially this is an, it has a separate uh, commemoration of pages inside referring to what happened in World War II to the, the Jews, this, is, this was from Morocco, to the Jews in Morocco and praising what they had all experienced. So the, the battle of uh, uh, Operation Torch and the, and the final liberation of North Africa from Nazi control, Vichy control, and uh, fascist control of, of Italy brought freedom to 
uh, the Jews of Tunisia, but under, obviously, uh, allied, contr allied control. And this was something that they, were, that they celebrated just as Jews in, in Europe celebrated. It was something that they had in common, but this has been forgotten, and I wanted to, I wanted you to, to be able to remember this as well on this day. I'd like to conclude with the, uh, the, the, uh, the command of the Piazetsna Rebbe, who was in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, he was given the opportunity to leave the Warsaw Ghetto by some Christian clergy, they told him, well, you're, you're a very, very influential rabbi. We could save your life. Um, come, we'll, we'll help you. And he said, I want to be with my people. And he, did, he, he, he perished in a, in a uh, labor camp um, during the war. But his students came to him, and they, and they said to him, because the, the, uh, he and his students and the Hasidim were not the people who were fighting in the Warsaw Ghetto, but they came to him and they said to him, Rebbe, should we fight? And he said, this, is, this time is different from all other anti-Semitism in Jewish history. All other anti-Semitism anti in Jewish history, they wanted to, they, they, were, they were willing to accept us if we converted. They were willing, to, they, they wanted our souls. This time they want our bodies. This time they want us to die. So the mitzvah, the good deed, the command is you must live and you must fight. And he told his students that they must fight. So, I, so with his words, we should remember that even every, every, um, every effort of Jews to be able to continue is one element in the fight against anti-Semitism. And I would like to just take his words with us for us to continue and remember him as, as well as all the others who perished. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fidwit. This was a side that perhaps many of us did not know. So thank you. It was moving and very informative. So our, our final panelist, um, and we'll just ask just a few, few things of you just to briefly address. This is Asa Schindelman. Keep me, it's too late. <laughs> Please, you can, you can stay. You can stay in your place. No, I must stand up. So Ms. Schindelman has spoken before the United Nations um, many times, and she's also a Holocaust survivor. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Asia Schindelman, and I am a Holocaust survivor. From the first day of the war to the last day, I was in the ghettos and concentration camps. Okay, I will try to tell my story short. A little bit about me. I was born in 1928. 1928, it's not a mistake. Thank you. It's not a mistake, it's 1928 in Europe, in Lithuania, a small country at the Baltic Sea. Our family consisted from six people, my mother, my father. I have a brother older than me, six years older, my grandma and my uncle. We lived very happily in Lithuania this time. Lithuania was a free country. We had our own house, a ranch, surrounded with a nice garden of trees and flowers. My father had a small car, Ford Eiffel. In this time in the city were only three private cars. I attended a Hebrew kindergarten, Tarbut, and then a Hebrew gymnasium, Hebrew school, where we spoke only Hebrew. I had a very good childhood in a well-to-do home. There was peace at home, love, and everything was very nice. But I, I was 11 years old, Everything changed. The Russian communists occupied in June 1940 all the three Baltic republics, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. And our life changed. 
because they, they did a lot, a lot of bad things. They, they closed our Hebrew school immediately. They took out all the Hebrew books from the libraries, from the stores. We were forbidden to speak Hebrew. Now Hebrew, if you speak Hebrew, you are going to Siberia. Okay, <clears throat> they confiscated a lot of houses, business, a lot. But the worst thing was then July the 14th, a week before the World War II started, began, they deported innocent people from all the three Baltic republics in the same night to Siberia without their belongings, without nothing. In the night, the KB, KGB came, take something, 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 where they were going, what they were doing, what they will do, we didn't know. And we were luckily that we stayed in, in Lithuania. But after a week, the German-Russian war broke out. The Lithuanians, they were not prepared for this war. There was not resistant, absolutely not. No. The Lithuanians, they ran away how they could to run. And the Germans, they had a lot of cars, motorcycles, and they occupied Lithuania in a few days. The same day when the war began, the, Lithu the Germans were in our city. The Lithuanians were very happy to see the Germans because they had a lot, a lot of, of tsarot, tsaros from the Russians. But with the Jewish people, the Germans were allowed to do everything they could. We were not allowed to go on the sidewalk, only on the road, along with the horses. This time there were a lot of horses. And we had to wear a Morgan David, a yellow star in the front and on the back. The Lithuanians were forbidden to sell us food, and we were not allowed to go to buy some food. And then they decided, the first what they do, to kill all the Jewish men. And the Lithuanian helped him a lot. And one night, they went from house to house, because the Lithuanians, they knew, knew where the Jewish people live, and where not Jewish people. And uh, they took the Jewish men, they brought them to the jail, and they shot them. My father and my uncle were very happy we could hide them in the attic, and so they survived this action, this terrible action. But this was also only the beginning. Then the Germans decided to take us to a ghetto. They built a ghetto, in the suburbs of the city, when in the small houses, but houses lived the Lithuan Lithuanian poor people. And they gave them our good apartments in the city. They went us to, and sent us to the ghetto. We couldn't take all our belongings to the ghetto. We lived everything, take something, 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 schnell, schnell, fast, fast, fast. And the gate was surrounded with a wire and was guarded by the SS. So nobody could escape and nobody could get out. We had a little food to eat, but something we had to eat. It was very crowded, the ghetto. We were three families in one room. I slept with my father and mother in the same bed. My brother was six years older than me. He never, we never saw him after the, uh, during the war. He was, he was studying in Kaunas. Kaunas was the capital city from Lithuania. And when the war began, he wanted to, to get back home, but it was not possible. And the Germans killed him in the first week of the war. He was only 18 years old. In the ghetto, they wouldn't like to have young children, young people. I was this time 12 years old, but I looked older. 
Then I was, and my mom, my father told them that I am 16, I am 18 years, and had to work along with the adults not to be killed, okay? And I worked at a military airport on construction work. It was very cold and rain, and we worked from early in the morning to late in the evening, but still I came back to the ghetto. There were my parents. There was something to eat. I had something. It was a little bit better than, in the, than it will be in the future. In the ghettos, they made a lot of bad actions. In 1943, November the 5th, it was a terrible action. They decided to kill all the children and teenagers, the German, the elderly people, all of them. And they came to the ghetto and they took everybody away. They took them to a forest and they shot them there. And the ghetto was like dead without the child. Maybe some child could hide in some attic or some place, but it was only, only some of them. No good? Thank you. Tell me, tell me. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much <laughs> for sharing English, some of your story. Thank English you so much. Is not so good, thank you so no, much. You moved no, everybody. Thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. 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 Do you want that me to end? Oh, okay. Now I have to tell about the concentration camp something. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. But when we were in the ghetto, we didn't know what is waiting in the future, what is waiting for us. And then when the front line changed a little bit in the beginning, the Germans invaded in Russia until Moscow and Leningrad. But then they had to move back, the Russians forced them to go back, and they didn't know what to do with us. And they decided to take us to the concentration camps in Germany. And we didn't know there was, you have to go out, you have to evacuate, take, take something, something, something. And we went 25 kilometers, that was in now miles or kilometers, by foot, still we reached a railroad and there were cattle wagons, freight wagons were waiting for us. And we had to get in the freight wagons and they took us to Germany. We were on the way about five, five days maybe and five nights. We didn't know where we are going, what we are going. It was very hot and the wagons were very dirty from on the animals, and it, no, almost no food, no water, nothing. But we saw that the Lithuanian signs change, and now are only German change. We understood that we are in Germany. And finally, the train stopped, and the Germans, SS, were crying, heraus, heraus, verfluchte Judenbande. <laughs> It means, yeah, out, out, Juden gang, gang is such a word in English. Juden, no, Juden, verfluchte Juden, no. And uh, we saw a big sign, Stutthof Waldlager. It means Stutthof, a forest camp, a forest camp. The camp was surrounded by barbed bar wire and German SS were guarded around. And when we came, they sent us, schnell, schnell, quickly, quickly, out, out. They were, the Germans were with very, very bad German do dogs, the shepherds. They are so bad, the German shepherds. Okay, and we came to the concentration camp there were immediately a selection. There were three groups, one side women, the other side men, and the third side were children and elderly people. My father and my uncle were separated from us, from me and my mother, 
and my grandmother was when the elderly people, and the elderly people and the children, they took them directly to the gas chambers and directly uh, after to the crematories. We couldn't say, didn't have the time to say goodbye to the grandmother. We never, never saw her in our lives. And us, they sent to the barracks. There were a lot of barracks in the Stutthof concentration camp. And every two, three barracks were surrounded with a gate from barbed fire because they were afraid that we could then communicate and do something bad. They didn't allow us to stay in the barracks during the day. During the day, we had to stay outside from the barrack like soldiers, you know, soldiers. And this was appeal, appeal, they did, did call it. And it was very hot. It was July 1944, and the sun was hot, and no water, and no... Hmm? And uh, I don't know how we survived this, but after was the wars, the wars were, when the war came back to Germany, they decided to take us to a marsh, Smerzi, Toten Marsh, a dead marsh. The marsh, everybody knows the dead marsh. And we were, it was winter, it was very, very cold, we were naked. They sent us out from the camp, and we had to march deep to Germany, and the whole road was full with dead bodies from the people. And who couldn't work, they shot. They shot and shot and shot. After a long time, they put us in a barn, a big barn, and we were in the barn three weeks. Without food, without, there were a lot, a lot of dead bodies. Every morning we found around, this is dead, and this is dead, this is dead. I was with my mother, my mother was very sick this time. I was also sick because there was a typhus, typhus epidemic, and I get a, a victim from it. But finally, finally, and in the barrack, I don't know how many people, four persons were alive. The Soviet Un Union liberated us. And after liberation, we have a lot of not too good things. I will tell only this, that I and my mother, after the liberation, we were for five months, five months in a military hospital in the city of Lauenburg till we could stay of our legs. My legs were frozen. They had they wanted to amputate them till the knees. There were no antibiotics this time, but it, before it was a German military hospital. Then the Russians took over, and all the Russians were German, uh, Russians, and there were Jewish uh, doctors a lot, and they helped us how they can. But after we were deliberated, my father found us. He was in Dachau in the concentration camp. We had to come back to Lithuania because this was the curtain, iron curtain, and the Russians didn't allow us to go anywhere. And when we came home, there was a lot, a lot of bad things with the Russian again. You couldn't talk about the Holocaust if you survived the Holocaust. It means you uh, were uh, working together with the Germans, we helped the Germans. And my father was after two concentration camps when sent to Siberia in a camp for 10 years without a trial, with nothing, okay? They wanted me also to send, but at the time I get married, I went to another city, Latvia, and so I survived. Now I'm happy I am here. We came late here, we came late when the Soviet Union collapsed because earlier we couldn't get rid of them, but thank God we are here and I have here two sons and grandchildren and grand grandchildren. But unfortunately, my husband is not anymore with us. But I'm happy to be here, and thank you, thank you. It was all very short. For four years to say in, in 10 minutes is very hard, but 
Thank you for your attention, and I hope that it will never, never, ever happen, not to us, not to our children, not to our grandchildren, and I hope there will now be war in the world, and everybody will be happy. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Asha. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Thank My you. bad English. Thank very you. Sorry. Sometimes I will, I will say you the story more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm a little speechless. Yes, of course. So, um, in drawing back my tears, I'm sorry. Um, I want to close. Uh, I'm sorry we ran out of time for questions, but in due respect to our, our speakers and to the president of the New York City Bar Association, with our reverence, if she will make some closing <coughs> remarks right now, Susan J. Coleman, the president of the <coughs> Hi, everyone. Um, it is really my privilege to close out this program. I want to thank you all so much for participating today. Uh, thank you, special thanks to the City Bar UN Committee and the co-sponsor, the City Bar Council on International Affairs, and all of our sponsors and speakers uh, for the day. And I really want to take uh, just a moment to especially thank Sophia. <laughs> um, I think you all know she has put her heart and soul and courage, which I am going to come back to, into today's program. So thank you so much, thank Sophia. You. Thank you for, the opportunity. for me, today's program is actually particularly meaningful as I am a first generation American Jew the daughter of two Holocaust survivors who escaped Germany. My father, from a very small town in West Germany called Gunstadt, right after Kristallnacht, and my mother, still going strong at age 98, escaped alone ahead of the rest of her own family from Leipzig, ultimately meeting up in Paris, leaving Paris the day before the Germans bombed Paris, uh, and making her way to the United States. My parents, both only children, met here, and though I have no aunts or uncles or first cousins, my family is made up of the very distant cousin who helped my father's family uh, to come here, and a very extended family of lifelong friends, Eastern European refugees, who escaped the Holocaust and formed a family here. As you've heard today, anti-Semitic violence and Holocaust denial are a threat to liberal society. The Holocaust remains history's most extreme example of anti-Semitism. Holocaust denial is a form of anti-Semitism that strives to negate the established facts of Nazi genocide of European Jewry that you've heard so much and so eloquently about today. From our panelists, we know that the climate of violence which nourished Nazism was ignited by economic hardship, religious intolerance, populism, nationalism, and in our own times with the growth of social media, growing verbal and pictorial violence in the media and on social media platforms. Sadly, we see this resurgence of all these malicious faces of anti-Semitic rhetoric and hate crime springing up in large pockets around the globe. And as we heard uh, from the ADL, very much here in our own country. The Jewish people have frequently been the target of these unconscionable attacks suffered through the ages from long and bitter bouts of systemic ra racism, haunted, hounded by anti-Semitic conspiracy theories projected in print, and subjected to the prevailing prejudice which, which ushered in the prelude to the violence of bloodshedding. Sadly, crude, overt anti-Semitism anti is on the rise all over the world. The truth is that anti-Semitism has deep popular roots and cannot simply be made to disappear 
by ignorance or complicity. The Jews of Europe clearly were not an artificial creation. They were real people, with their own language, religion, and culture. Their sorrows were palpable, and their persecutions were inflicted on them because they were Jews and for no other reason. But in this room, despite the horrors of the Holocaust and the annihilation, and annihilation of six million Jews, and now the rise of anti-Semitism on our very own shores, we have come together to reflect with an extraordinary passion for social justice and the unified desire for creating a world of tolerance. Hopefully, a world which will never forget its transgressions and its capacity for evil. Holocaust denial is a deadly game of make-believe. The internet, because of its ease of access and dissemination, its seeming anonymity and perceived authority, is now the chief culprit of Holocaust denial. The unbridled distortion of indisputable historical facts promotes anti-Semitism. Even though, as you've heard here today, the Holocaust is the best documented genocide and to deny its existence is insanity. As, as we heard earlier today, to hate one group of people is to hate all groups of people. And I'm going to quote the words of Benjamin Ferenc, who Sophia spoke about earlier, who passed away this month at the age of 103. Quote, the lessons which I learned from the Nuremberg trials are that if we do not devote ourselves to developing effective world law, the cruel mentality that made the Holocaust possible might one day destroy the entire human race. We must, we must re-educate the human spirit and the human mind. It takes courage not to be discouraged." End quote. The voices you have heard today, this afternoon, pave the path for all of us with education and re-education. Let us all take heart from each other and remain courageous. Thanks again for coming. Thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs> I can't stand on my shoes anymore. I never was one to wear heels. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. This has been a day of, um, of commemoration, but also a day of learning and a day of never forgetting. And uh, I think that uh, it's important to have a, a, such a venue, obviously. Uh, I'm, I'm indebted to the New York City Bar Association and to my colleagues of the UN Committee to the president that just spoke so eloquently. Um, and thank you, because without you, my audience here, our audience here, we wouldn't be able to, we would have a room full of crickets and we have a room full of thinkers. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for your time. Thank you.